Welcome, ladies, gentlemen, and everyone listening to today's broadcast of VORW International. Thank you for tuning in. I know it's been a little while, and um, I'm sorry for the delay. It's just, I, I'm like I'm like discussing current events in uh, each program, and it's just with everything going on. Some of them, I've, I've just been trying to figure out, do I want to discuss them? Do I not want to? You know, it's like, how do you even proceed? And uh, as a result, I've just kind of wanted to do this, and I'll delete something, then I'll say, no, nah, I don't want to cover that story anymore, or it's just a changing situation, etc., etc. And then secondly, and you'll hear me discuss this in a minute, there was this one issue with my tongue. I had this cut that was on it that made it very nerve-wracking to talk. That's better now. That's all good. That's all good there. And um, today I've just been doing some finishing uh, audio editing, so everything should be good to go. But it's it's always it's comical. It's like this stuff doesn't even bother me. It's like it's a joke, you know, one big joke, one issue onto the next, and now I have this issue with my ear. But nothing, nothing crazy. Nothing. Um, I can't I can't uh, live with or anything. So working through it and getting it done. So hope you enjoyed the show. Um, but in today's program, we're going to be discussing again a few current events semi-recent, and uh, again, if it weren't for some of these setbacks, I would have had this show done at least a week a week, week or so ago. But we're going to discuss um, just some geopolitical affairs um, with China and India. Also uh, bring up North and South Korea as well. We're going to discuss the uh, recent surge in COVID-19 infections in the U.S., as well as the media coverage of it, and uh, just a problem that I have with it. And uh, then we're just going to discuss uh, a couple little updates, radio-related, a few new programs uh, to the medium of shortwave, if you're interested. And then we're going to get into lots of good uh, listener correspondence and fan mail, lots of uh, different topics, different questions, different things to discuss and bring up. So that's your little uh, verbal program guide, so uh, hopefully it'll be a good, varied, enjoyable show. I think the runtime of this is going to be a bit over three hours, so uh, hopefully a good time waster, if nothing else. All right. As I do want to mention in every show, uh, there is some fan art for our uh, viewers on YouTube, and I do want to credit it accordingly. The first piece of fan art that you see is credited to a user on Reddit. Uh, This was posted on the Report of the Week subreddit. Username is TurtleDude dash d3 that's turtle dude dash d3 uh big shout out to him for submitting this piece second uh, piece of fan art goes out to virginia and she said my name on twitter is stump zaku uh, the username is rick af that's r-i-k-a-f so again uh, by searching r-i-k-a-f on twitter for more of her work you'll find it there uh, shout out again to Virginia. And the third piece, uh, this listener says, just use my Twitter to credit me. It's Geek of Kwai. That's a Geek of K A W A I I on Twitter. Again, G E E K O F K A W A I I. Geek of Kwai. So uh, that's the fan art. And uh, any feedback is welcome for the program, of course, to V O R W I N F O at gmail.com. Fan art is welcome there as well if you want to uh, send in a drawing or anything you want, honestly, if you're feeling artistically inclined, and uh, I'll certainly try to feature it in the next show and uh, credit it to you. You can uh, submit it again uh, just as an attachment or send the link to uh, the image hosting site that you want to have it on or whatever you want to do, I'm just, whatever works for you, really. But you can send that to the same address. And finally, last but not least... If you enjoy the program, you want to hear more of it, uh, this show really isn't monetized anymore. Uh, no no podcast platforms are monetized. And YouTube, nine times out of ten, uh, isn't because I deal with the current events and whatnot. But if you do want to support this broadcast, help it uh, continue, allow for it to expand, and uh, also be able to do shows more frequently, consider a contribution if you like what you hear and you want to hear more of it. That can be done via PayPal to V-O-R-W-I-N-F-O at gmail.com or via Patreon to patreon.com slash the report of the week. At the very least, think it through while you're listening. 
And without further ado, let's get into the show. Hope you enjoy it. This is VORW. Well, thanks everyone for tuning in to my broadcast. This show, I'm recording it on June 21st, 2020. Uh, I will admit, I will come in right now and just say, uh, some of this show is definitely going to be recorded, you know, probably on the 22nd or so as well. I think today we're maybe going to get an hour recorded and uh, then the rest will be the next day. Now, first and foremost, it's, it's like, why even bother? But I just want to. I'll say this, I've actually been dying to get to the microphone in recent days and record a show. Well, if you've been so eager to get to the microphone and record a show, why haven't you then? Why? What's the holdup? What's your problem? What's going on? Well, if you want to hear, I don't think anyone really had that sort of uh, aggressive reaction to it, but let's pretend for the sake of discussion. So Someone out there, maybe someone did, I don't know. But problem was that, and this is on me, you know, I screwed up, I did this to myself. I wasn't paying attention about five days ago, and I guess while I was eating or something, I bit the side of my tongue <laughs> pretty bad. And as a result, <laughs> every time I had talked, you know, not like casual conversation, but I'm talking at length stuff, you know, like this show. Every time I would try to do that, oh, the pain would just be too much, because you would have this wound and it would be scraping against the side of, uh, you know, of, of my teeth there. And every time it felt like it was just reopening and just, ugh, it was just so painful. And I said, you know, I had the desire to do the show, there's so much to talk about, but then when you do it and it just hurts more and more, then you lose your train of thought. Or, you know, if I really had to power through it, you know, I would be able to, but would it be a quality show? <laughs> yeah, absolutely not. There's not a chance that it would be. So, the only reason I was able to get the radio broadcasts on, because those I said, look, I can force myself to do 20 minutes of talk and then put the music in and do my thing. Those are on a schedule. Those are paid for. We're getting this out. No, I don't care. I don't care how bad that, how much it hurts, I'm doing these shows. And thankfully I found um, Origel that I had, which is, is supposed to, I think, mostly for gums and your teeth. It's a liquid um, topical anesthetic, I believe, that you can apply for dental pain. And it's, it doesn't last long, but it works. So I took a Q-tip, you know, soaked it in this Origel, and had to stick my tongue out, you saw where the cut was, and just scrub it in there real good. And at first, oh my gosh, it hurt like hell, you know, the stinging from the anesthetic. But then that stinging over like maybe 15 seconds would eventually transform into a tingling, and it would be totally numb. So, that numbness would work for maybe like 10 minutes most. Very, very temporary. But it was good enough to be able to say, okay, I can get to the microphone, do my thing, and uh, that'll be that. So, that's what I've been doing, but no uh, Origel today. Still feel discomfort, but it's like, it's gone from pain to discomfort. That I can live with, you know? If it gets any worse, then I'll take a little bit of a breather or something. But discomfort, you can live with discomfort. Pain, look, we all have to live with that. But if there's ways to avoid it, of course we will pursue that option more often than not. Well, today's broadcast, you know, let me let me tell you. I, there was some stuff last week that I wanted to discuss, but I decided, you know... I'm just going to pass on it. I'll look at topics, I'll look at certain things, and I'll say, well, you know, do I want to talk about it? Do I not? Sometimes I have an idea, then I, you know, I change my mind. and It's like, uh, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do it this time around. So, 
you know, had a couple ideas, but I scrapped them. We're just going to talk about some issues in the news, some other things. One thing that I just want to mention real quick in passing, I, I, I mentioned this in the radio show already. Yeah, I, thankfully, thankfully, look, this month has been very turbulent for the U.S. With um, the protests, the riots, the looting, the arson, the violence, you know, and every other thing that ensued during that. The hatred, the vitriol, the turmoil, and <laughs> let's not forget the virus. Number one, I hate, I absolutely despise this, this, you know, <laughs> this attitude that came around where it was like the virus doesn't exist anymore. So, and then now, now again, as the riots start losing momentum, oh, wait, the virus still exists. Gee, who would have thought? Who would have thought? So it's not, somehow it's still magically there. It gets me fired up, if you couldn't tell. But it's just, you know, I, again, this is another thing. I talk about a lot of things in the radio show that I don't talk about on YouTube because I don't feel safe discussing it on YouTube. Not because it's like, I don't want to he to people, people to hear me say these things. No, I want people to. I encourage it. Hope you listen. It's just I don't feel safe putting that in the hands of some of these online companies that they have their own rules. You know? That's why. I see their rules, and I'm doing this out of respect. I respect their rules. I'm not going to go and flagrantly violate them. So, any discussion that might, I keep to radio. Because that medium, if you pay for your airtime, they will give you the microphone and say anything you want. And by anything, especially if we're talking about shortwave, yes, I mean anything. And uh, it's just a, a good place to do it. You don't have to worry. Uh, but I do talk about a lot of things. And I was ranting against some of the mainstream media. Uh, on both sides, mind you. The left and the right. All the major, you know, the big networks. Pick one, you know, anyone, right? And we, we already know this. This isn't new. This isn't any big uh, change or anything. But it's like... Journalistic integrity for many of these organizations is long dead. It's all about an agenda, one way or another, uh, and trying to find things to legitimize that agenda. It's that, number one, and number two, to try to get, you know, the, the news equivalent of clickbait, something that'll draw the readers, the viewers, the listeners in, and thusly the advertisers, and all the fat stacks of cash that follow. And um, that's the whole business model nowadays, sensationalize. Every little thing is going to be World War III. Every little thing is a giant political upset. Every little thing is <laughs> the end of the world. Now, at the same time, you can see that, and you can become very jaded, and you can think that nothing ever happens. Because every little thing always gets blown out of proportion by the media. One good instance, I think, that in some cases, this doesn't work for everything. More for a slow burn type of event such as uh, the coronavirus, which, yes, I do think exists. I have from the start. Uh, that I think, especially again for these major slow burn type of uh, catastrophes, is if you see what's happening, and then you look, and the media isn't overreacting, and maybe they're even dismissing it, not in every case, but sometimes when you see that, and you just look around you and see what's going on, then you realize, wow, this is the real, this is the real effing deal right here. <laughs> you know, when I was looking, I mean, just what was going on in China at the time, and then the media here was saying that it's just like a little uh, a little flu and that no one's going to get it and you don't need to worry about it. I was just thinking to myself, are you out of your mind? <laughs> it's, it's just you see one thing, then you hear another, and it's, it's like, 
that's when I realized it was real, that this isn't just some overblown little thing. But sometimes things get hyped up and it's no, it's no hype, you know, it's... Well, look at what happened with North and South Korea. You get North Korea being, you know, they provoke. That's what they do. That's what they do. That's, I, I honestly think when they blew up that diplomatic building, that was not Kim Jong-un's personal doing. That was his sister. And people say she's evil. I don't know if she's evil or not. She's hardline, though. She's very, very hardline. More so than Kim Jong-un himself is. And people have to understand that. You know, it's... They always do certain things, not to this extent usually, but they always make these gestures, you know, these threats. That's nothing new. They'll sever the communication lines to South Korea. They're going to say, oh, this is it, right? We're not going to talk to you again. Uh, we are putting ourselves on uh, wartime footing, right? Uh, we will uh, uh, eviscerate Seoul. Uh, and, you know, if... if uh, and they'll just say these things here and there. This was an extension of that. No one was killed. No one was hurt. The building was empty. But the building that they blew up was the diplomatic meeting facility where, you know, face-to-face -face diplomatic engagements between North Korea and South Korea usually take place. What better gesture, especially to the North Korean public, would it be, instead of just saying, oh, we cut the phone cable again to uh, South Korea, than to literally take the building that is symbolic of those relations and, and blow it up? <laughs> You know, it certainly got people talking. Certainly did. But that's that that isn't World War Three. It never was. It's a show. It's it's an act. Of course, South Korea is gonna see that. They're gonna they're really behind the scenes they're just shaking their heads, just saying, uh Yeah, here they go again. Alright. Just do the same old, same old. Yeah, it's they're not panicking around, they're not saying, get the missiles ready. <laughs> it's just, it's the usual. They kicked it up a notch, but it's not going to lead to war. It's just a show. It's a propaganda move. So when they blew up that diplomatic building, that's all that it was. And I believe that diplomatic building was either in North Korea or was right on the border. I think it was in North Korea, but I may be wrong. That's the other thing. It's not like they launched missiles, you know, 30 miles over the DMZ, deep into South Korea, and then blew it up, and a bunch of civilians who were hanging out across the street got killed as well, and, um, you know, uh, mortars are being lobbed over the uh, DMZ at, uh, you know, South Korean positions. No, <laughs> that's how people acted, and that's how the media reacted. And if you didn't know any better, that's what you would think was going on by reading some of the headlines. This got some coverage, but nowhere near as much as that. Uh, the tensions between India and China. If you want to talk about World War III, it's not going to happen there either, but that has ten times more of a possibility of going hot than anything North and South Korea are doing right now. And... I'll take a side right now, and I, I've researched this as well, the border clashes between India and China. I support India right here. I really do. That's it. I made my case. I've, I've taken a side. I don't hate the people of China, but I do have problems with their government, especially in this instance. Now, putting that aside and addressing any potential bias just right off the bat, the conflict between India and China is a complex one, and we won't talk all day about it, but it's, it's saying, think of it similar to the conflict between India and Pakistan at the present time, especially in regards to the Jammu and Kashmir region. You have this disputed border, right, with India and Pakistan. India says it's theirs. 
Pakistan says it's theirs. No one is budging. So they both send up troops and some clashes ensue. And you have this disputed territory that's just, they both say it belongs to them and there's occasional fighting. That's between India and Pakistan. India and China do have a similar situation where especially in northern India, there is a length of border between India and China that is disputed. There are a few towns and a few areas. It's pretty remote. Uh, Don't think of this as being like some sort of highly populated area. I believe the province in question, I believe it's the Ladakh region of India, Pretty remote, pretty rural. You can see pictures of it for yourself, and it's you would even go as far as to say very barren. It's mountainous. But again, exactly the same situation as India and Pakistan. China says, hey, you know, these ravines, these mountains, let's even say a few of these villages, etc., which may in some cases be deemed strategic, uh, this is part of China. India says, no, it's not. It's part of India. Well, the same exact thing happens. No one's budging. India isn't saying, all right, fine, China. Yeah, I take them. I don't care. Yeah, go for it. Well, well, we'll draw the line here. Take it all. I don't care. It's, it's not how it works. It's not what happens. So China has troops there. India does as well. And they have for decades. Again, similar situation with India-Pakistan. They've been there for decades, okay? The difference. When India and Pakistan face off, you know, it is in a traditional military setting, right? Um, Small to even medium artillery, uh, automatic weapons, even on occasion airstrikes. Now, that's rare, but it did happen. Even last year, you actually had a full-blown dogfight between the Indian Air Force and the Pakistan Air Force uh, that resulted in planes getting shot down. I mean, a full-blown air battle, you know? That's some serious stuff. However, with India and China, the troops on both sides are armed. But the difference is that there's this long-standing agreement that if they are to use firearms against each other, that may escalate it into a full-blown war right away. So while they all have firearms available, instead they... It, it seems so weird to say this, but instead they guard the area largely with these improvised weapons, like the type of stuff you would see out of like The Walking Dead. And on June 15th, there was a major clash that happened between the Indian Army and the Chinese People's Liberation Army. Now before this, you would have occasional fights. It would be like childish stuff. I mean, there'd be a couple Chinese soldiers and they'd pick up some rocks and throw it at the Indian soldiers. (laughs) Like stuff like that we're talking. But on the 15th, you know, I've, I've been seeing reports, and I'm not going to verify this, but some reports said that it was China that kind of lured the Indian uh, forces into a trap. I don't know if that's true or not. But what is confirmed is that a long period of uh, large-scale hand-to-hand combat between Indian forces and Chinese forces. I know the Chinese soldiers were armed with, if you would believe it, like these baseball bats with uh, nails sticking out of them. And I don't know what uh, India had. So I'm talking like these brutal improvised weapons. And for six hours, they were going at it. Uh, It resulted in the deaths of uh, 20 Indian soldiers as well as uh, 76 injuries. On the uh, side of China, 43 Chinese soldiers were killed. So, when you look at both of these situations, 
Now this is gonna de-escalate, it already is. Don't think that they're gonna go to war, I really don't think that's gonna happen. That's, it's de-escalating. India is surprisingly good at de-escalating these situations. They're gonna, they're, they're gonna work out of this, it'll be alright. That's not gonna happen. Not gonna go to war or anything. But look at it this way, okay? Between China and India, these two massive powers, you had in total at least 63 deaths, counting both sides in this brutal, disgusting, again, hand-to-hand -hand combat. But in North and South Korea, a building with no one in it gets blown up. Not to say that that's not a bad thing, but when you look at it that way, which one is more serious, right? At least a given moment. But which one gets more coverage? Alright, so look at that. Wow, I really got sidetracked, but why not? I wanted to talk geopolitics anyway, and we, we, we got into it. But look at how the media covers certain things. They make one thing look like it's going to be World War III. The other that really had more possibility of that happening got some coverage, but nowhere near the amount. Things got sensationalized. We know that. And the one thing that I just, I, I hate is the fact that it's like they forgot that the virus existed over the last few weeks and that mass gatherings were all of a sudden fine. You know, you hear, you hear about, and I'm not, look, if you want to protest anything, I, I don't care. You can go for it. You know, I support your right to protest. You just have to do so in a peaceful and civilized manner. That's why I, I've never supported the riots, I've never supported the looting, the violence, the arson, any of that. And I'm supportive of good law enforcement too. I don't understand where people were, were trying to put these words in my mouth saying, oh, he hates the cops, he supports the riots, whatever. When did I ever say that? I never did. But sometimes I think you get people that just, I don't know, they're bitter but Heck, I can be too at times, so... Honestly, when people, when they when they think differently, you know, about a certain issue, they have a different viewpoint, I'm not the kind that's gonna do that. I'm not gonna put words in their mouth. I'm not gonna sit there and yell at them and attack them and berate them. Instead, to me, it's like, you know, hey, we don't see eye to eye on everything. That's fine by me. But if you want, I'd be happy to sit down have a drink, and talk it over. I want to see why you feel the way that you do. I'm interested in perspective, truthfully. And I, I just wish some of the people that, and again, it was actually, it was people on both sides that, that berated me over my thoughts on this. I just wish that they could open their eyes and instead of being blinded by like this childish rage, I wish they could just talk to me and tell me why. They feel the way that they do, but no one ever does. I'll sometimes even respond. I'll write back, I'll say, well, why do you feel this way? I'm interested, interested in knowing what you think. I know you don't like me right now, but uh, yeah, I'm interested. What, what, what ticks in your mind? I was curious, that's all. It's just something that's always fascinated me. But anyway, I don't understand where some people were saying these things, or why they were anyway. But it's like, if you want to protest, again, you have to do it in a peaceful and civil manner. What I don't understand is when you, you get the media that for so long was saying mass gatherings are dangerous with the virus. You know, you can't have sports games with the fans present because it's a risk. You know, people sitting right next to each other in the stands, whatever, can't have that. Same applies to concerts. No concerts. We, uh, we, we don't want that. Uh, even eating indoors in a restaurant, right? That has its dangers. Even going out to vote in person, standing out in line, going to the polling place, etc., does have issues. Uh, political events, right, are under criticism as well. 
So you go off of the most basic facts scientifically about mass gatherings, going out by the thousands, shoulder to shoulder, in the street, is no different. Now, I'm not saying, oh, they should have just canceled the protests completely. Again, I, you know, if someone wants to go out and protest, I, I support that right to do so. It's just, to me, what bothers me is the fact that they acted like, if you do this, you are immune from the virus. And you're not going to get it, you're going to be fine, don't worry about it. I just wish that they actually had the decency to just, it doesn't even need to be for a long time, just say, every now and then, you know, remember that there is an increased risk in getting COVID-19 from these protests. And people might say, oh, well, everyone there is young, uh, a lot of people there have masks on. Both of those things are indeed true. Yeah, absolutely, they are true. But number one, masks are effective, but they are not foolproof. Meaning, do not bet your life that this mask is going to save you. M you know, certain ones, like an N95, could protect you. Masks do work better if everyone wears one. Here's the issue, though. Number one, depending on where you go, especially, some of the protests don't have a lot of people even wearing them. Number two, like we said, they aren't foolproof. Things can still get in and get out. Number three... One thing that I saw in video after video is when tear gas or pepper spray was used. What happens, what do you see a lot of? A lot of coughing. People cough. They, they all start coughing. They're trying to get this agent out of their lungs. You know, it's, they're irritated. A lot of people, they take the mask off. They have to. It's... They feel like they're burning. They take the mask off, they pull it down, they're trying to get water or milk or whatever they want to use to try to help. Well, the mask is off. They're coughing like crazy. I was just thinking, my gosh, if you had one asymptomatic carrier there, just one, and you could see the clouds of the virus that are there, it would be a sight to see. So, that's another concern. And then number four. All right. They've got the masks. A few will still get it, but they're young. They have good immune systems. Well, it doesn't matter. They'll get a little sick, but so what? So, even if someone gets it from the protests, they're young, they're in good shape. They don't get a severe case or even a moderate case. Maybe they're asymptomatic. Maybe they just feel a little off, maybe have a slight cough, but they think it's allergies. You couldn't even tell it's the COVID. They don't even know they have it. So they, they go visit their parents while they're symptomatic. Their parents, let's say, are in their 60s or 70s at risk. Guess who gets it now? And guess who ends up faring a whole lot worse? Maybe even dies. That's no better than the same silly attitude of trying to say a couple months ago, don't worry about the virus because it only uh, kills old people. Yeah, who cares about the old people, right? Their lives are worthless. <laughs> That's what that statement tells me. I disagree with that 100%. Lives are very valuable. When lives are on the line, it would seem like at least the tiniest little sensible thing that they could have possibly done is at least give a common sense statement didn't even have to discourage anything that's not what it's about it's just a tiny even tiny little statement saying there is a risk of the transmission of coronavirus so please be prepared and please try to be responsible but not a peep and now that the worst, at least, of some of the riots has died down, now it's fine to acknowledge the fact that mass gatherings are dangerous. Or at least that there is that increased risk. Maybe not dangerous. I'm sure some of you listening went to protests, and you're still feeling fine. And if you had the chance, you could probably get a COVID test right now, or an antibody test, you'll come back clean. You didn't get it there, you're fine, you're safe. 
yet you were with thousands of people. It's just because you're there doesn't mean you're going to get it, but there is that higher risk. It's like you're rolling dice. What are you going to get? Is your number going to be up? Most likely not, but there's that chance. And I wish they told people to prepare for that. But alas, they didn't. Now they are, once again. But it's, it's, it's like, you know, the hypocrisy. I call it like I see it. I don't care who it is. And sometimes when I do that, I know what I say is incorrect at times. Sometimes I'm just speaking from emotion or impulse, just from opinion. But like I said, I just, I try to call it like I see it. And this is just very bothersome. You know, down here in Florida, the cases are out of control. It's totally out of control. One record high number after the next, after the next, after the next. And it's only going to get worse. It's still going up in probably 25 states. In three states exactly, it's peaking at enormous numbers. Texas, Arizona, and Florida. The media here is taking this seriously once again. I just wish they never stopped, to tell you the truth. Problems like this, they just, they don't go away just because something else is going on. You can have problems running concurrently at the same time. And yes, you're going to have to balance them, you're going to have to juggle them, but don't just look at another whilst forgetting that one thing that's uh, still a very big issue suddenly doesn't exist or matter anymore. Just have to juggle them and find a way. Because this thing is important and it's not going away. This is VLRW International. All right, well, next up in the uh, broadcast, we're going to be getting into uh, some listener correspondence soon. I, I have more to talk about, but it's just... I don't know. I might do another show soon where I'll just discuss... Maybe it'll be, you know, an in-between program where maybe I won't... I'll let the emails build a little bit, and I'll just talk about a couple current events, or maybe I'll... I don't know. I don't know. I might do another show soon where uh, I'll just discuss some more things going on in the world. But in the meantime, uh, here we are. One thing, I think I mentioned that at the beginning already, I recorded the very, very start last, so I haven't really gotten there yet, but just keep in mind, the broadcast, it continues on thanks to your support. I know the economy is is a bit difficult right now. I know it still is. It's probably going to be for the foreseeable future. But if you do want to support this broadcast, a contribution of any size, any shape, is welcome via PayPal to V-O-R-W-I-N-F-O at gmail.com. Again, via PayPal to V-O-R-W-I-N-F-O at gmail.com or via Patreon at patreon.com slash the report of the week. The broadcasts really aren't monetized anymore because I don't want to try to not discuss current events and, you know, just so I could get a green a green light. Uh, this is my show and I'm going to talk about what I want to talk about. As a result, they say, okay, maybe we won't destroy them from YouTube and shut down your account, but you're sure as hell not going to get uh, really anything monetized. Well, that's fine. That's I'm willing to do that. You know, it's it's like otherwise, do I really even want to do this show? Uh, not really. I I just I have I have it a certain way, and uh, that's just how I I enjoy discussing what's going on in the world, and I think it's important to at least at least talk about some of these things. So consider it if you would like. Just look at it this way: if you like what you heard and you want to hear more of it, that's how it's possible. Just keep that in mind. Okay. Quick little update on the world of shortwave. Not too much to talk about. Just a few new programs that are on the air right now. Uh, to bring to uh, one's attention. And just a few quick updates on the medium. By the way, shortwave radio. If you want to talk about free information, that's it right there. There's no censorship. No obstructions. Uh, no worries about... Is it going to conform to some certain algorithm or not? You can have a show yourself, and you can discuss anything, and I mean absolutely anything you want, without any sort of fear or worry 
uh, about any sort of obstruction. It's truly a free medium. That's why I like it so much. And uh, if you do want to do a show like mine, you can get in touch with me. I'll send you to the right people at these uh, good stations like WRMI and WWCR that can uh, really get you on the air to North America. Good station in Germany also that can get you to Europe. And uh, I'll just I'll point you in the right direction. I'll help you out. There's a show that's on the air right now that uh, I was able to help out. Be happy to help you as well. Another thing, make sure you get a radio. I'd highly recommend one, especially with everything that's going on right now. For today, uh, you'll be able to find the link to my Amazon store, which has a lot of different models, a lot of different types of radios, uh, very prominently listed. For all purposes, there's some real high-tech receivers that could be used for, you know, hardcore listening. You have some more inexpensive models that don't break the bank but still do a good job. There's emergency radios for, uh, let's say, severe storms, natural disasters, uh, hurricanes, etc. Of course, we heard about that earthquake down in Mexico. Uh, Something like that. I mean, you know, thankfully, it wasn't totally destructive, but we know there are areas that are earthquake prone. And earthquakes, tsunamis, etc. can bring everything down if they're strong enough. Hurricanes, etc. We know that. The infrastructure is very fragile. Radio is usually a last resort medium, but if everything, if everything goes down, you've still got that. That might be your lifeline one day. Let's hope it never gets to that point, but who's to say? I think it's good to be prepared. I'm a strong advocate of that. And uh, it's just, when everything is going all right, there's still lots of entertaining and informative programs. All the radios that I recommend come with AM and FM. Of course, you can hear your local radio stations as well. And international shortwave band uh, that you can hear international broadcasters, domestic programs, music, news, Uh, political talk, religious, even conspiracy theorist broadcasts, and everything in between. There's still stuff on the air, and it's always fun to scan around. You never know what you're going to get. Of course, you can hear my broadcast on it as well. We're on a good number of frequencies to listeners in North America, and thanks to your support for listeners in Europe as well. But all these broadcasts wouldn't be possible if it weren't for your contributions. Some of the radios that I would recommend, uh, again, can be found at Amazon.com slash shop slash the report of the week. That's Amazon.com slash shop slash the report of the week. You could find the link to that in the comments in the description on all platforms. But if you are interested otherwise, you can uh, find a few radios that I really recommend uh, you could search for them, the Texun, T-E-C-S-U-N, P-L-310, E-T. I also recommend checking out the Texun P-L-380 radio, or the Retekes, that's R-E-T-E-K-E-S-S, V-115. The first two radios are under 50 bucks, the uh, last one is just for 25 bucks. There's many others, though, available at this store. See if anything appeals to you. Uh, There are always new things going to the medium, new changes. Uh, It is an always changing medium. So first and foremost, it was um, reported in the news, in the mainstream news, that the Voice of America, the uh, United States international broadcaster from the government, has new leadership now. Uh, Originally, the folks in charge were actually left over from the Obama administration, believe it or not. Uh, Now, the VOA is still a prominent broadcaster, but it is by no means as big as it once was. Uh, Again, consider the fact that the people who were appointed uh, back under Obama were still in charge, you know, almost four years later. They're not very high up on the list of priorities. Uh, Now, the new uh, Trump appointee in charge of the VOA is uh, a controversial figure. Some people like him, some people hate him. Uh, As for me, 
I'm not going to jump on the bandwagon just yet uh, to condemn him as director of The Voice of America. Because the, the one thing that a lot of people aren't seeing is the fact that under the people... Look, it doesn't matter who the person is appointed by. Some people just do a bad job. I don't care if they were appointed by uh, George W. Bush or if they were appointed by Obama or if they were appointed by Trump. Some people just do a bad job. And the VOA under Obama did a lot of things that I wasn't a fan of at all. Uh, they cut some vital radio services to Asia. Uh, that resulted in massive, massive amounts of complaints from listeners who had no other way of receiving their programming because they deemed radio too old school. And then, you know, a couple months later, the uh, outcry was so large, they brought most of them back. Stupid, stupid moves like that that just make no sense. Maybe sound good, like, oh, we're getting rid of the old technology, but then they have to backtrack, and then they just look like idiots. The VOA also is uh, rated for the company of its size as having some of the lowest morale <laughs> of any company. I mean, so many of the people that work there are just miserable. Uh, there's issues in terms of the timeliness of the news, the reporting, the information, uh, the overall quality of the programs, etc. And uh, lots of issues. And these are all under the Obama era appointees. So, uh, you know, a lot of major uh, media outlets are really jumping on this guy who was appointed by Trump and are already saying that, you know, they're not a fan of him because they, they don't like some of the documentaries he made. Now, like him or not, the VOA certainly could be doing better. And the people previously who were in charge of it, maybe they tried their best, maybe the whole institution is just a mess. But I'm just interested in seeing what does this new appointee as director of The Voice of America and all of its affiliates as well, Radio Free Asia, Radio Free Europe, etc. Uh, how does he do? I mean, maybe he's going to turn it around. Maybe he'll do a good job. Maybe he'll be even worse. I don't know. But I'm just reserving judgment until I can kind of see how he decides to run things. He really might not do anything. He'll just leave it. I mean, I don't know. We'll see. So we're going to see what happens, but they've got a new, uh, a new head honcho in charge. And again, a lot of, a lot of uh, media outlets have kind of been jumping on him and have been saying, no, it's going to be awful, it's going to be terrible, but I just can't get there yet. It's like, look, I'm just going to gi give him a chance. Let's see what happens. Let's see what happens here. So that's one big uh, piece of news, radio-related, that's uh, gotten a lot of attention lately. Secondly, we have a few new programs on the air. Um, there were two clandestine stations, just from political movements, that recently got on the air. There's a uh, station from, I guess, a political opposition group uh, targeting Kashmir in India, which has uh, recently started up. There's also a new broadcast to, uh, I believe, Ethiopia. And then there's actually a third new uh, political broadcast to, uh, I believe, Djibouti, which is also in East Africa, which I think the government there blacked out the internet. I imagine maybe due to some unrest or whatever. So now you have a group over there that's turned back to shortwave to uh, get the message over to listeners in uh, that country. Because in East Africa especially, uh, shortwave radio is insanely popular. It's like, you know, the equivalent of AM radio over here. Not everyone listens to it, but there's still a population, a sizable population, that does. So you have that. Uh, over here in the U.S. on um, WRMI, which is a uh, radio station that I use uh, for my show, you have three new programs on the air right now that uh, recently got on. So uh, I do want to publicize them. WRMI is a station that you can just buy airtime off of, and again, if you want to do a show of your own, I'll point you to the right people there and uh, do what I can to help you out. 
same thing with WWCR to uh, stations in the US they saw their airtime by the hour um, but you have three new programs the first two are heard on the frequency of 15770 kilohertz at the time of uh, 4 p.m. to 5 p.m. Eastern so the first show is uh, again on 15770 this frequency targets uh, Eastern North America and uh, Europe as well first program I want to uh, publicize is on Mondays again from 4 to 5 p.m. Eastern and it's called Red Banner Radio uh, from what I can discern the program features some music of uh, various genres and then it uh, also features a very far left-wing uh, political talk as well it's officially described uh, this is what it says uh, join host Matt Coker in Houston, Texas for an eclectic hour of opinions and music you don't hear on local radio stations from Bach and Chopin to Metallica uh, Matt is a relatively new shortwave listener and he thinks there should be more alternative daytime programming for listeners so again you can hear that uh, 4 p.m. every Monday 15770 kilohertz a second program on that frequency uh, that also is interesting comes on every Sunday at 4.30 p.m. Eastern on 15770. It's a half hour long and it's called Memphis Weirdos. And uh, I know the host of that show is actually a, uh, a listener to my broadcast. And uh, I messaged him about his show and uh, he said that it's a half hour weekly show that features some of the uh, music scene from uh, Memphis, Tennessee. And uh, just trying to share it with uh, listeners around the world. So that's uh, mostly, I guess, like local bands uh, centered uh, to the Memphis, Tennessee area. Music show, 30 minutes in length every Sunday, uh, 4 to 4, 430 to 5 p.m. Eastern, 15770 kilohertz. The third show can be heard every Monday and Tuesday from 10 to 11 p.m. Eastern on 5850 kilohertz. It's actually the exact same time and frequency uh, of my radio show, except instead of being uh, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, 10 to 11 p.m. Eastern on uh, 5850 kilohertz, that frequency targets all of uh, North America, you know, the U.S., Canada, and Mexico. And it's a program called Quorum Radio. That's Q-U-O-R-U-M Radio, Quorum Radio. Uh, I've listened to it a couple times, and uh, I've also been in contact with the host of this program, uh, the host is Bill McIntosh, and the show is described as offering interesting guests and eclectic music for a North American audience. Uh, again, I've given it a listen, and I think it's an interesting show. There's some good music, uh, again, various genres, but it's also intersped with uh, various interviews as well. And uh, the interviews are interesting. I mean, you know, I've I've seen that the show discusses uh, sometimes various uh, conspiracies, uh, sometimes political talk, sometimes just random uh, discussions, but it's interesting. Uh, you know, if anything, take it as either uh, entertainment, perspective, however you want to look at it. Uh, the other day I tuned in, they were talking about the JFK assassination, various uh, theories of that. Uh, so I think that there will definitely be some uh, people who might be interested in, in that show. Quorum Radio, 5850 kilohertz, uh, 10 to 11 Eastern. So feel free to give that a listen also. And uh, those are three new programs on WRMI. So it's good to see that. This is the type of programming that I like. It's uh, just, you know, some discussions, some music, some... It just seems like some good radio. Over the last few years, uh, Shortwave had this reputation of just being all religious programs. But it looks like more people are actually starting to realize, hey, I can... You know, I can buy some airtime and uh, do my own show and maybe contribute something to this. Uh, you know, that's you know that's that's why I've been doing what I've been doing. But you have lots of uh, new shows that have been popping up like this last the last few years, and it's just great to see. The uh, medium needs more of it, 
and that's just good to see that. So that's why if you do listen to any of these shows, make sure you uh, let the host know that you tuned in. That's why I always say when I do the shortwave broadcasts, make sure you send in an email to me because I have no way of knowing that anyone out there is listening. And the reason why I continue all the broadcasts that I do is because there's a solid stream of correspondence that comes in. Otherwise, I would have no clue that a single person is tuned in. So everyone else is in the same boat as me. And for me, anyway, I can't speak for anyone else, but it's a lot of fun to just see where listeners pick up the broadcast from, uh, where people listen in, what the comments are, how uh, reception was, etc. It's just a lot of fun, and it's great to uh, connect with the listeners out there. Fantastic audience. Alrighty, with that, let's just get in to uh, some listener correspondence. This is VORW, Radio International. Welcome to the mailbag portion of today's broadcast. Thank you for, uh, well, being here for this part of the show. The name is really self-explanatory. Uh, in this part of the broadcast, we take a look at listener correspondence. Uh, the correspondence really doesn't have any sort of theme to it. We just open up the email and read listener letters. The fantastic thing about it is truly the fact that it is quite diverse. You never really know what you're going to get. From various questions or comments, to topic suggestions, to little tidbits of information or stories that the listeners have to tell. It changes from one show to the next, and it's really the variability that makes this such a fun part of the broadcast to record. And I think it's a reason why a lot of listeners enjoy hearing it at that. Now, the mailbag portion of the broadcast is not possible if it weren't for you, the listener. Granted, how can you have a listener correspondence program if there was no correspondence to be read? Resultantly, if you would like to participate in this part of the broadcast, your feedback is welcome. Questions, comments, pieces of feedback, reception reports, and of course, do you have any questions for the broadcast? Do you have any topic suggestions? Any stories you would like to share? Have you read anything interesting in the news lately? Anything interesting on Wikipedia? Have you watched an interesting video? Is there anything, absolutely anything, you want to share with the program? This is a clean slate. It is yours to do with as you please. Write whatever you want. If really, it doesn't matter. Write anything you want. Way to contact the show is simple. Send an email to v-o-r-w-i-n-f-o at gmail.com. That's v-o-r-w-i-n-f-o at gmail.com. You can be a first-time listener, a long-time listener. You can write in after every show. This could be your first email, but the more feedback, the merrier. Uh, I will try in the next show to get to whatever I can. In today's broadcast, we will be reading about 45 emails that came in. As a standard disclaimer, I must say that I cannot guarantee that the correspondence submitted will be read in the broadcast. However, I certainly make the best effort that I can to try to get to it. So please keep that in mind. If you do write in, there is a very good chance I would say in upwards of 80-90% that it will make it onto the show. Again, feel free to write in v-o-r-w-i-n-f-o at gmail.com. On one other note, if you are feeling a little bit creative, as we've been doing in these recent programs, if you feel a little artistically inspired, if you'd like to create and submit a piece of fan art that will be featured in the next YouTube airing of this program. You will be cre- you'll be credited at the beginning. I'll be happy to credit you um, by your name. I can give your website if you have your art there. Uh, if you have a social media you want me to promote, I will do that as well. Uh, if you just would prefer to make it and, you know, again, do it anonymously if you want, I'll respect your wishes. But anyway, if you do want to make a piece of fan art, have it featured in the broadcast, and you will be duly credited. You may submit it via email to v-o-r-w-i-n-f-o at gmail.com. Simply send the file as an attachment to the email, 
or if you have it on a third-party image hosting site, you can send the link to it in the email. I will get to it. And with that, let's get into things, and let's take a look at some of our feedback for today's show. Like we said, we have a good amount of emails here to read. We'll get to what we can get to. <laughs> That's uh, it's as simple as that. You know how it is. Some things I'll go on a lot longer about than others, but let's see what there is. I marked them down. Here we go. And this is the first one. This is the last one, and everything in between we will read. I'm going to do what I did the last time. Let's pick a random one and uh, go from there. All right. All right, we picked it off uh, with a short email from uh, a listener. No real name was given. I'm not going to repeat the uh, the address. Uh, has a question about the camera resolution for the YouTube videos. He says, why don't you record in 4K 60 HDR? It would be nice if you don't compress it down to 1440p and record at 4K 60 HDR, please. Love your podcast and food reviews. Keep up the great work. Well, thank you for your inquiry. Unfortunately, that's not going to happen, and I want to tell you why. Uh, you know, you're one of the first people who's actually outright asked for a video to be in such high uh, visual quality. And here is... See, here's the thing. I, You know, you can check and see how many people viewed the video at each resolution, right? Everywhere from 144p to 1440p. And as a matter of fact, if you look, still, even in 2020, the majority of videos on YouTube, you have a few exceptions now, but most are still in 1080p. Because if the camera is of sufficient quality, the 1080p resolution also thereby is of sufficient quality and it's visually stimulating for most people i began here's just a little bit of a backstory for the fun of it uh, ever since i started doing the youtube videos i've gone through a variety of cameras and i understand people have their preferences i do too that's why i just go with what i like but you know coincidentally this seems to work for many uh, viewers as well. That's why I stick with it. Sometimes simplicity is key, mind you. Uh, sometimes you really don't need to do all of that. Uh, you know, for the videos that I do as well, the 1440p uh, provides fantastic resolution for the food that is being reviewed. Uh, it, it, it serves its purpose, is what I'm trying to say. Even 1080p does. Because you can have a camera recording in 4K. The setting is also important. You can have a camera recording with 4K resolution and the, you know, frames per second, etc. And if the lighting is terrible, it's not going to matter. And it's going to be like you did all this for nothing. And that resolution, it's just not going to make any difference. Whereas you can have very good lighting and a camera that only records in 1080p, and it's gonna look better than the 4K one in bad lighting. So there's other factors at play. And also what really is overkill. I think that just for the food reviews and everything, 4K is just uh, overkill. If I were doing videos, perhaps that I were going around and filming beautiful scenic um, areas and places and then a 4K camera may make more sense, because there might be more to see. Uh, then, of course, I would want to capture the full beauty of nature and uh, the optimal resolution. But in this case, for what I do, that's why I just I go with the resolution that I go with. But as I said, to give a little bit of a, a backstory, so to say, uh, originally, when I started the channel in 2011, the camera that I used was actually a little sophisticated for its time, believe it or not. And sometimes I'll see the occasional comment pop up on the videos 
from 2011 and say, how how did you record with this back then? <laughs> Everyone, I think especially some younger people, which is fine, assume that like cameras back in 2011 were, <laughs> were terrible. Uh, no, not at all. Uh, some of the cell phone cameras were a little iffy, but even those were getting much better, better than a cell phone camera from 2007, you know? Uh, so already they were getting decent uh, as well. But no, the cameras back in 2011 were not pieces of garbage. The resolution wasn't even that bad there. Uh, the first camera I ever used was a flip minnow camera, which actually recorded in uh, 720p, but with uh, 60 frames per second. So it was still in HD, you know, for the time, and uh, the shot was very, very smooth. Some people, again, today were saying, how, how did you record in 60 FPS? In 2011, well, I just did. It's just what the camera was. Uh, then from 2012 to 2016, when the flip camera had many technical issues, I switched over to the older camera, uh, which was very old school, 480p, um, muted colors, tape, you name it. Very, very old school technology there. And yes, that looked like it was something out of the 90s, but... That aesthetic was incredible. Um, it's 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 great. I still have that camera. As a matter of fact, I could I could break it out one day just for the fun of it if I ever wanted to. But uh, that camera was was great. So yes, originally the resolution and all of that were higher when I created the channel, and then it dropped when I switched to an older camera. Again, from 2012 to 2016 for at least a good four-year span. Uh, then in 20 parts of 2016 and through the majority of 2017, I used, you know, a 1080p uh, digital format again, right? That's a big change. And then from 2017 onward, I've been using the uh, 1440p resolution. Right now, I just checked I can record in 4K. I have the ability to do it. I just looked and I can press a button and every video I do from now on could be in 4K. And it could have been since 2017. But I choose not to. Because like I've already mentioned, I just don't think it's necessary. I don't think it's a necessary upgrade. Maybe one day for the heck of it, I'll record a video in 4K just to, you know, mess around. But really, I don't think that it's, it's really necessary. I don't think all too many people will notice, and like we were uh, saying at the beginning, a majority of viewers, a very, very high percentage, watch the video in 1080p, then 720p, and then 1440p. And I would imagine if I recorded in 4K, the number would be even smaller, because not everyone's computer is perfect. Not everyone's streaming capacity is perfect. Not everyone's internet is great. And uh, the 4K video might might look good for someone with a good setup, but for everyone else, it just might be ch you know choppy. It might not might buffer a lot. Who knows? So that's just why I have the ability to do it. I, I have for years, but I just choose not to. So that's what it comes down to. So I hope that answers your question. I, I know sometimes people want certain things, but I'm just that's why I wanted to explain why I do things uh, the way that I do. So I'm sorry if. The resolution was, you know, a little disappointing. I, I still think that the 1440p is, is uh, very nice, but, you know, to each his own. Next up, we have... This email comes in. Uh, Dear Sir John, I'm a long-time fan, first-time contributor. Like a lot of listeners and viewers, your shows have been a massive source of support and enjoyment for me in times of strain. Last year, when I was struggling with anxiety and low mood, and all I seemed to be doing was working, watching the report of the week became a highlight of my week, a time when I can catch my breath and shut off. So much so that I asked my partner for a review bra mug for Christmas, which she remembered. Believe me when I say I'll be forever grateful for those ten minutes or so of respite that you have provided for me that you continue to provide for me with the food reviews and random talks that you provide for millions of others like me. 
Two things I wondered. Question one. What do you eat when you're not eating fast food? Do you ever cook from scratch? So first uh, question, and then we, we will get to the second one. First question, uh, yes, largely, you know, I do eat the fast food, etc. You know, number one, I eat a, a variety of things. Right now, I admit, I, I eat a lot of frozen food right now. Could I say it's necessarily good for me? No. Is the stuff that I eat good for me? No. <laughs> so there, that, that evens out, I say, as a joke. But, you know, I, I eat a lot of frozen food because of the virus and stuff. I just don't like... I don't like going out to begin with, but again, with the coronavirus cases uh, going through the roof here in Florida, you know, it's... I don't think it's any surprise why I just don't really want to be going into restaurants right now. I don't really want to be running to the supermarket time and time again. So believe me, like those little mini Red Baron frozen pizzas, I can't tell you how many frozen pizzas I've had the uh, this last few uh, span of months, but I've, have, I've had tons of that. Uh, sometimes I'll have, you know, I'll make little sandwiches, I'll make you know, more simple stuff, BLTs, um, sometimes some chicken sandwiches. I mean, sometimes I'll, you know, do a little here and there, but... I am by no means a cook. I'm not going to pretend that, you know, all of a sudden I'm, uh, you know, master chef. And, uh, oh yeah, you know, I was um, the uh, chopped champion on Food Network, right? But that was back when I had the, uh, you know, the giant mustache, so you didn't recognize me. I'm not going to I'm not gonna BS you and say that. Uh, so I'm by no means a master, master chef. But the one other thing that I should say is that I really don't eat all that much. Uh, you know, I'm I'm smaller. I'm on the smaller end of the uh, the scale, both in terms of height and weight. I don't really that doesn't bother me. Some people are all all about they have this this target. And everyone's different, you know. They want to. Everyone wants to look a certain way. Um, but because I'm smaller, I just don't have a big appetite. Uh, you know, I I don't really have any sort of ravenous hunger. So I don't eat much. I eat once a day. Um, lots of coffee, you know, one meal a day. Some snacks here and there. And that works. That's worked for me for years. It's not, so I don't think that's any sort of new, newfound habit. It's what I've been doing for the last, I don't know, five, six years now. And it's enough sustenance. I'm able to do my thing, have energy to go about my business go for walks, exercise a little bit, stay active without keeling over. So, hey, it's unconventional, but it works. Feeling good, doing good, and um, staying active as well. All right, secondly, uh, question two. As someone who is known for their command of the English language, I was curious to know your thoughts on predictive text sentences and programs such as Smart Compose and Smart Reply. Are we creating an over-reliance on AI rather than actually learning how to construct a sentence with flair and style? Yours sincerely, Anthony, Manchester, England. Uh, for your second one, I've seen lots of uh, advertisements for those types of programs that it's like they write for you. You know, it comes, you know, it comes to that issue, convenience versus having the skill. I think in certain circumstances, right, it becomes okay to have something replaced by, you know, a certain technology if it's of no severe detraction. This, on the other hand, is something as basic as reading and writing. I think that affects literacy. I think people should be able to know how to construct a sentence, how to write on their own. They shouldn't, they shouldn't depend. It's one thing to have a spell check, something that can adjust your grammar, your spelling, etc. Uh, because we'd all like to read something that is coherent, that's legible, that has that flow to it, right? That's understood. But when it comes down to the writing itself, it's one thing to fix spellings, it's another to just, 
you know, type a couple words and then have everything else written for you. Uh, you know, you see that in, in when you're searching on a search engine, that I don't have a problem with. That's just basic convenience. But in the case of uh, writing an email, if this thing practically writes it for you, or you can really make it with just limited, limited effort, uh, that's an issue to me. I think it's just something that people should be able to do on their own without the aid of a program to really do much of the legwork for them. I don't think such programs should be done away with. There are going to be times where someone is pressed for time and maybe such a program will really come to help you. So I can see it being reserved for, uh, you know, let's say sometimes that you really need it again. I just don't think it should be used all the time. Uh, I don't I don't use it for that reason because I enjoy writing. And I just think it's a skill that everyone should have and, and use regularly. So, you know, I can't say I'm a fan of it, but I could see where it can be helpful in certain cases. I just don't like how some people become 100% dependent on that to write for them. Because all of a sudden, if that thing was gone, forget it. <laughs> just, just forget it in some cases. Wouldn't be pretty. <laughs> That's all we've got. Thank you for your kind email, Anthony, for checking in. All right. We have an email coming in from Ben. Hey, Review Bra, big fan and World War II reenactor here. I'm curious how you get your 1940s style mid-Atlantic speaker voice. Did it take a lot of practice? Thank you from Ben. Thank you, Ben, for your question. You're going to think I'm making this answer up. You really will, but I'll tell you a story. Uh, this isn't something that I trained myself to speak. This is just how the words happen to come out of my mouth. There's no real rhyme or reason as to why I pronounce things the way that I do. It's just how, how I talk. And it is something that has evolved over the years. Here's a bit of a story as to, again, you might say, yeah, but how? I don't, you know, I don't buy that because you don't hear many people in the United States with that manner of speaking. So how can such a thing just be done without any thought put to it? Unless you practiced and unless you're faking it, then why are you saying that you didn't? Well, it's a unique story, but it's one worth telling since you, since you mentioned it. When I was, when I was young, I'm talking very young. When I learned how to speak, for some reason that no one could ever figure out, I could never figure it out. Because to me, right, when you talk, unless you really listen to yourself in a recording, which unfortunately I have the displeasure of, of having to do, I hate listening to myself, by the way. That's why when I edit all these broadcasts, I just, I, I detest it. I just say, all right, because I just don't, not the editing. The editing is fine. It's work. I don't mind it. It's just having to hear my voice. I hate it. And, you know, unless you're listening to your voice under scrutiny, looking to edit anything or having to review these tapes or broadcasts or any of that, your voice, as you're talking, it just sounds like your voice. It's not like you really pay attention to any sort of enunciation. You're just talking, right? You don't really pay attention to how it sounds. It's just, you're talking. It's just, your, your, your voice sounds like your voice, right? It's, oh, I pronounced the R this way. I pronounced the T in this. It's, it's like, you don't think of it that way. So when I was young, number one, my voice was just my voice. It wasn't, I sounded this way or that way, right? But again, when I was very young, learning to talk, up until I'd say maybe 11 years old or so, maybe 12 even, no one could figure out why I sounded this way. My parents couldn't. My family, rest of my family couldn't. Teachers couldn't, classmates couldn't, but it was just accepted that, all right, this is just the way that uh, that he talked. 
As I began to speak, I spoke with almost a, uh, a British accent. Maybe not quite British, but there was definitely a very evident non-rhotic characteristic to it, which was very, very prominent. I remember one instance, because again, I just didn't think about it. I didn't think that I spoke non-rhotically. I didn't think that at all. I was just talking. And I remember the one instance, the only one that I really can recall at the time, was, I remember someone pointed out to me that just saying the word, word, right, I pronounced it as word, instead of, as the Americanized pronunciation would be, word, right? Word, word. And now I just say something in the middle, I just say word. You know, it's not, the O is not pronounced, I don't really say it as word, <laughs> you know, nor do I say it the other way, it's just a, you know, a mix, I just say it word. It's just maybe a little softer on the O. But, you know, it's just a mix of, of the two at this point. But anyway, so from when I first started talking, again, up until around the age of 10, uh, largely I spoke in a non rhotic uh, manner. Because again, I was also really unaware. I, would, I, I was at the point where, you know, classmates would say, are you, uh, are you British? Um, did you really grow up in Boston or is there something? I couldn't figure it out. No one could. Uh, much to the consternation of some people in my family who were saying, why does he talk that way? But my parents were fine and they said, look, he just talks like he talks. So what? He can communicate effectively. What does it matter? But as I got a little older, again, once you start getting around 10, 11 or so, you start paying a little more attention to yourself. You're not, you know, you're not like a kid anymore. You still are. You, but you know how the mindset starts changing from child to young teenager. And I started focusing and started realizing that the way that I talk is, is different than everyone else, at least in the area. And I decided I wanted to change that. So I started trying to get rid of the non rhotic uh, pronunciation. And, you know, it's really, really hard to drop an accent when you had been speaking with it for <laughs> up until that point almost my entire life. But by and large, I had really been trying. So by the time that you, you know, you started getting the very early videos on my YouTube channel, I was trying to, you know, speak with more of a, uh, just a neutral, you know, American accent. And my voice still kind of sounds a bit similar, but, you know, it was also going through the voice change with puberty, so you had, you know, kind of sounded, you know, squealy and creaky and all these things. Um, in 2012 and 2013, I decided to try to pick up, make a few adjustments to, instead of just a neutral uh, American accent, I tried to just add a couple qualities of more of a, a standard New York accent. And then, <laughs> you know, because it's hard work to keep trying to say, all right, you got to talk like this, you got to talk like that, you got to, don't say it this way, say it, and you have to keep correcting yourself. And finally, around 2014, I thought to myself, why? Why am I doing this? Is there really going to be some sort of payoff if I talk this way or that way? What is it going to matter? It's not. So... I said, you know, forget it. Don't sit there and scrutinize yourself because you have this manner of pronunciation versus the other and that you don't totally sound like, you know, someone on Long Island when you say this or that or the other thing or uh, whatever, whatever. It's like, yeah, don't worry about it. You don't need to sound like someone you know, in the Midwest. 
and you don't need to sound like someone who, you know, is working in a, a pizzeria in the Bronx. And you don't need to sound like someone uh, living in upper society in, in, in England. Just sound like how you sound. Talk as it comes out naturally. So that's what I've been doing ever since. And from that point, this is just the byproduct. That's why nothing's forced. It's just whatever comes out, comes out. That's why sometimes you will hear words that still have that little bit of that non-rhotic quality to it. Um, others will just be standard, you know, neutral American, and others still will have more of a New York accent to it, because it's all three of those that I had intentionally, at least two of which, intentionally tried to make myself sound, that all just come together now, and that's what you get. Uh, which I would not, you know, I guess the only way you could describe it is almost that at least mid-Atlantic style of speaking, but it's nothing that I intentionally try to do. And if you compare it to how I sound right now, listen, listen to an old radio drama from the 1930s, say, you know, one that, the first one that came to my mind, of course, a classic, The Original War of the Worlds by uh, Orson Welles. And you'll see very quickly how pronounced the style of, of mid-Atlantic speaking back then is, you know, compared to anything else. Uh, you know, it's just much more pronounced then. I could make myself sound that way if I wanted to, but it would be forced. What you have here is, again, just what, whatever comes out, pretty much. And that's why, like, the other reason... I think why some of those older, you know, non-rhotic uh, qualities still come out is because when it comes down to pronunciation also, to me, it's it's easier to to say it that way. It's just, I don't know, it's more relaxing on the, uh, I don't know if it's the jaw or what, but it's just, I don't know, it's more relaxing for it to come out that way than to emphasize something else, and no one ever has any problems understanding me, so... Why not? No harm, no harm in that. Um, but thank you, Ben. It was a very interesting question. And, uh, it's... I don't know if I've... I don't know if I've ever talked about it in that great detail before. But, why not? It's, it's a story that I don't really get asked about at all, so I thought, well, why not? May as well, uh, may as well mention it. Certainly, it's... You know, early on, when I was first learning to talk, again, it was the source of much frustration to some people. But a lot of kids just thought it was kind of cool that I, I talked that way. I wasn't bullied or made fun of over it or anything. You know, again, when I was growing up, all my peers were fine with it. They thought it was kind of cool. They were like, I remember the one in middle school, one person was saying, oh, you, you, you remind me of uh, Stewie from Family Guy. And uh, I thought that was, that was funny. But that's what... Uh, that's what we've got. Thank you, Ben. Next up, we have an email coming in from Jacob. Hey, Report of the Week or Review Bra, whichever you may prefer. Just letting you know, I'm still tuned in to the YouTube videos and SoundCloud uploads. I unfortunately do not have a shortwave radio, but I would consider getting one for a reasonable price. The main issue I have is that I work night shift and sleep all day, so it is difficult for me to catch the show during its original broadcast time. I am disheartened to hear about your recent troubles related to the new channel and removal of content. It's completely ridiculous to me, and I feel YouTube in its entirety is headed down a more restrictive, less creative path. I'm going to try to scrape together a few dollars to support the channel. I think it's a nice avenue for people to escape the craziness that 2020 has brought upon us. If it is any consolation, I will tell you I purchased one of the Disappointment is Immeasurable coffee cups, and it held up quite well in the dishwasher, actually. I also enjoy the food review videos on the primary channel, although I can see how bored you've become doing them. <laughs> hey, I can't blame you. 
I'd be bored too after years of reviewing fast food products. Only so much you can say about greasy, cost-affordable products shoveled to the masses. Anyway, that's enough blabbering from me. I wanted to... I wanted you to know the insight you offer on your radio show is valuable, and not disregarded, at least to me. Even if for some reason the show cannot be continued in the future, I would be in favor of a podcast secondary upload on the main channel. I'm not sure how risky that would be, but I would support it. Thanks for the content. Stay healthy. Stay sane from Jacob. Thank you, Jacob. And if you if you saw me right now, you'd see the smile on my face after after you said, um, I'm bored with the reviews. <laughs> yes, indeed, they can get repetitive. They're still fun to do, but yes, you know, you, you hit it on the, on, on the spot, spot on. Only so much you can really say about them and you know that like that croissant crust pizza sometimes you have these items that look so promising and well <laughs> look let's be real that thing didn't look promising but it certainly makes it look good the picture that is makes it look good um but then i opened the that thing that thing from DiGiorno, the croissant crust pizza stupid it was a stupid item and i i'm not afraid to say that now it's it's like have you ever seen a croissant crust pizza before? No. May, well, think logically. Maybe there's a reason why croissant dough is not usually used to make pizzas. Eh? Any, <laughs> you know, does that make any sense? And you can just imagine the reaction. <laughs> you know, I was watching this thing. I said, cook it for like a half hour. It was... <sighs> I'm looking at it. Because the last thing I ever want to do when I'm reviewing the pizza is to burn the thing. Because, especially right now, I was doing this video at 3 a.m. And I felt like I really needed to get the video up on Sunday, the 21st. And I was doing the video at 3 a.m. that morning. Sunday morning. Obviously, I knew if I wanted to get it up that morning, this pizza is my one shot. And again, I really felt this video needed to go out then. So I was even thinking to myself, you better not burn this. You better not, because this is your one shot. So imagine, you know, my reaction when, you know, like 22 minutes or so, I'm looking and it looks fine, it looks even anemic, it, like it's still cooking. I thought, well, all right, maybe this thing still needs to cook a little longer. Then at 24 minutes, what on earth happened in that span of two minutes? I couldn't even begin to tell you. But the thing is puffed up like a giant balloon and the top of the pizza is just brown and getting darker by the second. And I know in the video I said I might have said a bad word. You better believe I said, oh, F. And I <laughs> opened the door real quick. I t t took it out. I was shaking my head. I was thinking I, I was thinking to myself, you did it now. You ruined this. And uh, you totally blew it. You totally blew it. And, you know, again, what happened, I think, is because it was so layered. Maybe the air got trapped in between the layers. Heat rises at that top layer. Got lifted up. And because it was so thin, these, all, these layers are all just wafer thin. And then, you know, of course... As it cools down, it sandwiches back together, and that's how you get this the structured pizza. But as it's cooking, you have the air that's lifting up this, all the layers, but the top layer, right, is wafer thin. It has the hot air from the oven on the top, right, hitting the toppings, the sauce, the cheese, the pepperoni, but you also have this hot air from the bottom. And with it being so thin, as soon as it got propelled up into that 400 degree air, it just cooked just like that, insanely fast. And I say without a doubt, had I had not checked on it until 27 minutes when uh, they said it was supposed to be ready, the thing would have been burnt. I mean, it would have been totally blackened and I would have to scrap the video, you know, because a few committed viewers would, I think, enjoy the fact that he burnt the pizza, but most, you know, most, uh, infrequent viewers or people looking for the review would be like, I don't want to see the burnt, the burnt thing, I want to see the pizza. And they wouldn't be a fan of it, so. 
it was uh it was oof. it was a surprise and then it didn't even taste good to begin with so it was like oh well there we go there we go but yeah, there's only so much you can say about it but it's still fun to try it out it's just this whole year has been slow you know with the with the covid you know so many places just i think have put any new releases to the side and then also with all the stuff getting canceled you know i guess wendy's is canceled and uh this and that and the other thing is it's like oh should if if let's say wendy's were to release a new thing am i allowed to review wendy's anymore <laughs> you know i don't know i don't know am i am i not you know what what would happen if i did do a wendy's review next who knows <laughs> it's I, I think most people forgot that Wendy's was supposed to be canceled, to tell you the truth. But that's that's how it goes. So thank you, Jacob, for your email. Uh, we have a short email coming in from Chris. He says, I love the podcasts. Listen to it as I go to sleep, as a matter of fact. And I love the uh, videos. Wanted to ask what pizza chain do you think is best? All right, Chris. Well, let's just keep it at... um. You know, let's just keep it at the major stuff, because let's most of the best pizza chains are all all local, all local at this point. But my favorite big carryout pizza chain right now is uh, Papa John's. Papa John's, I am a fan of. They do a good job. Pizza quality is just is good. Uh, so I would say Papa John's right now, at least as my favorite. I know, you know, with the with the Papa John, now he's he's just bitter because he got kicked out of his own company, and he's just, of course, he's going to say their food is terrible now, and um, that's why he doesn't like them. He's just he's bitter because and I, I I understand why he's angry, but that's why he he keeps just ragging on them. But I think their pizza is pretty good, honestly. I've always liked Papa John's. And uh, I've been been getting them recently. So Papa John's is my favorite uh, carry-out delivery pizza chain. I'll tell you what. In the last show, I talked a little bit about Pizza Hut, how they had some variability that they've been hit or miss lately. Uh, I was going to get Pizza Hut the other day. I was going to... I really haven't in a while. But I said, eh, I'm really craving their uh, stuffed crust pizza. You know, because I got a little email with, like, a... I don't think it was a coupon, but it was just, like, a promo for it. Just letting people know that the the stuffed crust pizza, I guess, still exists. And, uh, yeah, that got me thinking. I thought, yeah, yeah, I could go for one of those tonight. So, I order online for uh, delivery. You know, the contactless delivery. And they're out of it, so... I wanted the frozen... <laughs> the frozen pizza. No, I'm thinking about that DiGiorno still. I wanted the stuffed crust pizza, but they didn't have any at that store. They were all sold out, so I don't know if other people were feeling the crave as well, or if supplies were just limited, but yeah. The ad for it was actually pretty cool. Let me just see if for the heck of it I can still pull it up. It was like retro. Yeah. Like retro. I don't know if that's supposed to be like 70s or 80s. The, the the text that they say stuffed crust in just reminds me of like a retro again 70s it looks more 70s esque maybe late 70s I don't know maybe 80s but I'd say 70s I don't know I thought it's cool though a stuffed crust pizza it's pretty it's always been a favorite of mine from them so uh, thank you Chris checking in all right let's power through some more um some more emails here johnny writes in says uh hello there long time listener love what you're doing keep up the great work my question what is the worst dine-in restaurant you've ever experienced well now you see that's a, it's an interesting question of course although it's difficult because i don't really go to dine-in restaurants of course if you want to consider a restaurant that simply has the capacity for in-person seating, <laughs> then easily I would say, at least in recent memory, that absurd uh, steak and shake. 
you know, it was terrible. But otherwise, I haven't gone to many dine-in restaurants on my own. I just, I mentioned this in the last broadcast, just due to my anxieties, I just really don't go out all that much to begin with. And when I was younger, before the uh, anxieties really took hold, uh, when I would go out to eat with my parents, they generally had good taste in restaurants. Uh, they would always go to ones with good reviews, and, and for the most part, we weren't really uh, disappointed. You know, we just check, see what's being talked about, make sure the place isn't something you would find on uh, Kitchen Nightmares or something, and um, go from there. <laughs> I, I have to tell you, though, I have been watching more and more of those uh, Kitchen Nightmares episodes because there's so many of them, and I don't know, it's just a good show. One thing I'd recommend for anyone interested, make sure you check out the uh, the UK version of Kitchen Nightmares as well. It's It's more toned down than the U.S. version, but I don't mind that at all. You know, the U.S. version is very uh, bombastic. It has all the the fanfare and the sound effects and just how loud it is. The U.K. version is much quieter, but I like that, to tell you the truth. I've been watching a lot of those. <laughs> Gordon Ramsay, though, let me just say, uh, you know, on one other note, he... I gotta, I gotta say, I mean, he, he looks great. <laughs> what, he's 50 now? And I saw an episode from 2006, I think it was, or even 2005. He looks, he looks just as, he looks, you couldn't even tell that that episode was t from 2005. I think it was from 2020. So, I mean, he really, he, he looks fantastic. There's no way, you would not be able to tell that at least 15 years has gone by. I don't know, he must just have good genetics, but that's all that I got. Thank you, Johnny. Autumn checks in, says you're going to talk about the current spike of cases uh, of COVID-19. Uh, absolutely, I've largely discussed it already, but yeah, in terms of the, uh, the COVID-19 spike, I'm not surprised. I mean, I've said this before, and I'll just say it again, I'm not surprised in the least. I was waiting for this, to tell you the truth. Uh, I really have. This isn't the second wave, either. One good analogy that I, I heard, I think it was even earlier today, was that this is more equivalent to one giant metaphorical tsunami wave of cases, as opposed to a spike and then it retracts and it's gone. This is just one long endurance event. The first wave never ended and it may never will. There may not really be a full-blown second wave. It's just going to be one giant, um, you know, metaphorical, metaphorical tsunami wave of cases. Maybe, you know, I don't know. Just don't expect this to go anywhere anytime soon. Look at COVID. This is, this is life now. There will be a time where it will be safer, you know, but this is going to be with us for a while. Let's look at the numbers right now. Let's check some of the uh, statistics here. Yeah, today, Worldometers, by the way, is a great site. I think I plug them in every show, but they're very good for statistics, but yeah. Uh, 160,000 new cases today. Just a few of the countries reporting the highest numbers are Brazil with 40,000, United States with 35,000, India with 15,000, Russia with 7,000. We have Mexico and South Africa with uh, 4,500. Uh, the countries of Saudi Arabia, Peru, Bangladesh, Chile, Pakistan, all reporting cases in the 3,000 range. Many other countries reporting uh, 1 to 2,000 cases. The uh, United States... 35,000 cases, that's a number that's caught my eye. I'll tell you why, because we haven't had a number that high in a very long time. 35,000. Let's look right now, let's look at the chart, and let's see when the last time we had 35,000 cases was. 
Wow, you have to go back. Okay, let's even look. Let's let's search. Okay, May 1st, we had 36,000 cases. Before that, you have to go back to April. April 25th, April 24th. Um, and then to April 4th. I mean, there's very few days that even have over 35,000 cases, so... And that's when New York, you know, is really popping off. That's what that was attributed to. So, yeah, the rest of the country is just going that way. Uh, the states with the most cases, uh, California, Texas, Arizona, Florida. Uh, then followed by Georgia, Louisiana. So... Let's see what counties in Florida have the most new cases today. Florida reported 3,200 cases. That's not the most. There was a day they reported 4,000. Miami-Dade, Broward, Orange County. So Miami-Dade, Broward, those are Miami. Orange County is Orlando. Palm Beach, that's again South Florida. Hillsboro and Pinellas counties, that's Tampa. Duval County, Jacksonville. All right, well, that's self-explanatory. Every major city has more cases, which is, of course, that's common logic. More cases in the more populated areas, of course. But I'm not surprised at all. I'm not surprised to see the cases going up. I just, here's the thing. Most states that haven't seen huge increases are going to be put through the ringer right now. I just really hope that New York, New Jersey, uh, Connecticut, those three especially. Especially New York and New Jersey. But the whole tri-state area. I just hope that they don't have a surge. I really, I really, really don't want to see that happen. Because they have been through a lot at this point. And they have just been some of the only states in the country at this point that, you know, it's... They've been trying to do the right thing, largely. Yes, to the frustration of some people, but you see their numbers, the, they number, the numbers speak for themselves. Look at the case numbers in New York, if you don't believe me, and you're going to see a perfect decrease consistently in cases as other states continue to spike. They've... Uh, They've been doing the best that they can, and it's just, the thing that I hate seeing is a lot of good progress get reset. You can have so much hard work, so much effort, and so much progress that can be set back and destroyed in such a short span of time by people who have no clue how to rebuild it in the first place. It's a harsh example, but I was just thinking about that, and that's just the sad thing. It's like you see so much work that's gone into trying to get the numbers down in some of those states. But is it going to catch up? Is carelessness just going to take charge, take hold, and are they going to go back up? They probably will. And I really, that's that's what I dread looking looking to. But we'll see. I can't see any sorts of stay-at-home orders coming back here in Florida. I really, I don't. <laughs> I just don't. I'm sorry. don't think that's going to happen. I think it's just going to get worse and worse, and uh, it's... That's it. I just don't see it. Unless the death rate gets astronomical, like if you end up having a confirmed, you know, 20 to 30 percent death rate, which isn't going to happen... You know, then I guess, but otherwise it's not, it's just not going to happen. Yeah, Disney's going to reopen, all, you know, it's going to happen. Again, the ship has sailed. What's, uh, what's, what's done is done. We're in the midst of the storm at this point. We're in the midst of it. You know, we had that ability a while back to see those storm clouds on the horizon and avoid it. But we sailed right into it, now we're in the midst of it, and you just gotta hunker down and ride it out. That's all you can do at this point. There's, a, there's nothing left, there's nothing to avoid when 
every single way you look, it's all around you. So just gotta just gotta deal with it. It'll pass one day, but it's gonna be a while. You know, it's you might say, oh, that's that's not very optimistic of you to say. I know, no, I know it's not. I know it's not. But I don't think there is. One thing that's really bad is false optimism to say, uh, yeah, in a month it's all gonna be better. Well, what if it isn't? How do I, how do I know that it's gonna be better in a month? I don't. So you can't you can't look at it in that way. You have to say, well, one day it will be, but don't sit there and kid yourself. You gotta be real. Even if it's depressing, you still have to be. Let's uh, continue here. Kevin writes in, hello, John, hope all's well with you. Do you have any favorite movies? Personally, I love movies and I try to watch at least one every day. A few recommendations are Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, Dr. Strangelove, Rear Window, Come and See, and Days of Heaven. I wish you good health to you and your loved ones. Best regards, Kevin. Thanks, Kevin. Uh, thank you for the movie recommendations. I'm not a big moviegoer, to tell you the truth. I haven't. When was the last time I even saw a movie? I, I'm trying to even think, and I can't even remember. <laughs> I don't know. It's been a long time. It's been a long time. Now, I haven't seen any movies recently. I'm just not a big... I don't know. I'm not a big movie uh, movie watcher. There's not any movies that are, you know, coming out anytime soon that say, oh yeah, I gotta go, uh, gotta go get this one, gotta go, you know, get this movie, see it, or whatever. It's just not, it, it's not at that point. Oh, I guess the last movie that I saw was, again, like a month or so ago, um, Joker. Joker movie. Which was good. I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it. I thought it was a good film. And, uh, otherwise, that, that's... That's been it, pretty much. So I don't, I don't watch anywhere near as many movies as, um, as you do. I watch television a little bit here and there. Uh, the antenna television over the air broadcast, because it's just I don't see any reason in paying for cable television. If there's like one or two channels I'm gonna watch, why pay for it? You know, I can live without it. So save a couple bucks. You have an antenna. And uh, you just see whatever broadcast channels you can get. As long as I can get uh, the news uh, and then crime uh, slash uh, police uh, shows, I'll be happy. I know, I know the sentiment, you know, against law enforcement and whatnot is is uh, very strong right now, but I don't care. Uh, it's a genre that I've been a fan of for a very long time. You know, I uh, watch... So many of those, you know, true crime type programs, old and new, you know, even so there's one channel, one channel that I'm very thankful that I was able to get finally, uh, Court TV. If you believe it, it's still around. I thought they got rid of Court TV uh, when uh, it was replaced on cable by True TV like a decade or so ago, but it's surprisingly, it's still, it's still around. And I didn't know that. And I really had to mess with the antenna because it was... The signal for it was very weak and uh, it's just, you know, it, it just doesn't come in. It was just very, very pixelated and you can't watch it. But finally, I was playing around with the uh, television antenna and I found that of all things, if I put the, the TV antenna, you would think, you know, to get optimal reception from an antenna, uh, you want to have it outside, you want to have it at a high point, you want to have it, whatever, right? Well, this completely defied common logic, but if I put the antenna on the floor, in a certain spot on the floor, then it comes in just fine, and if I put it anywhere else, it's a garbled mess, so. You know, if the antenna is on the floor, who cares? Uh, but Court TV comes in, and, uh, then they have a second channel, but I, I like watching, I don't know what it's called, I don't think it's called In Session anymore, but there's a program that's on the air for like six hours a day, where they just discuss all of the various high-profile uh, court cases going on right now, 
and uh, in great de in great detail. And the legal system interests me greatly. Uh, if I wasn't so inept, you know, I'd even thought of, of maybe getting a career in it. But it's just a, I'm I'm not cut out for it. But that's not going to stop me from being interested in it. But the system of laws and the legal system and all that, it's, it has greatly interested me. That's why I'm fascinated with so many of these shows. Uh, and that's why I, I, I really do enjoy watching uh, court cases, especially live. If you could get a live feed of a courtroom, I'll watch it. I'm always interested in the proceedings. But there's Court TV, then there's a second channel, Court TV Mystery, which comes in a lot clearer, but there's no courtroom-related stuff. It's just all, um... All, I guess, like, crime shows, where they have, I know he's not doing this anymore, but they play a lot of older, um, well, from 2017, Crime Watch Daily with uh, Chris Hansen, and they do show some of the uh, To Catch a Predator clips as well, which is always entertaining. One show that I always like is Bizarre Murders, that's, they do it with a sense of humor, I always like the way they cover that, but so many others, there's lots about the FBI, um, even get some old school forensic files as well. Um, then there's another channel that I watch as well. I think it's called the Justice Network. And that one, I think there's a show, I think that it's on that one, called Intervention. I think I've talked about that one already a couple shows back about drug abuse, etc. Uh, then there's one show called, I think it's called I Survived. And oh my gosh, that one, it's very raw. It's just people who came very close to death, and um, they're just telling their stories. It's literally just them set up, you know, almost like in an interview, and they just tell their story. There's no dramatizations, none of that. They're just talking. But it's very powerful, and let me tell you, uh, it's, not, it's not really like a totally feel-good show. You know, there's another variant of that show called I'm Alive, which is done in the exact same format that is more feel good, you know, where it's like, oh, someone was, um, you know, swimming and got attacked by a shark and was on the edge of death, but he was able to pull through with his family right there at the hospital and stuff, you know, that's like a feel good program. That's I'm Alive. But there's the other show called I Survived, which isn't. It's like, you know, I was stalked by this guy and kidnapped me and chained me up in his basement and did all the, you know, and it's like, it's real. It shows you how some of the bad people that we outlined earlier, the things that they're capable of doing, but it also goes to show the resilience that some people have, even when faced with all this. But it's a powerful show. It's a powerful show. That's why I watch it. And you get a few others here and there. The one thing, you know, I understand, again, I guess in, in this climate, that cops and um, live PD were canceled. The Cops wasn't a show that I really watched much anymore. I used to watch it back in, like, 2012. But the thing, the thing that I always realized with Cops, at least, is that a lot of the officers in that show always, they, they kind of played it up for the camera a little bit. I think they were a little harsher than usual to get some good material for the show. Live PD was, was much was much better. Um, it was more laid back. Most of the officers on the show were, uh, were, were cool people as well. Uh, they were pretty fair, pretty understanding, weren't discriminatory or anything. They, uh, they were decent. I think they were good examples of uh, good, upstanding police officers. Of course, you get a few, uh, you know, a few that maybe would be more subject to controversy, but largely I was always a fan of Life PD, and I was very sad to see it get cancelled. I had a feeling it would. I had a feeling that it would. As soon as I saw what was going on, I thought, you know, the days of, uh, of this show, despite liking it, it's numbered, so get, get ready for it, and sure enough, it was. But either way, that show isn't available on, um, on the over-the-air television for me, so I would watch it online. But otherwise, I watch a lot of those shows, again, because it's just it's interesting. It's 
that whole field has always interested me. And again, I don't care, again, with everything that's going on, don't be ashamed to have an interest in the legal system. If anything, it's something that I strongly encourage. Know the laws, know what, you know, know the rights, know what types of people there are in this world, both good and bad. It's, it's I think, a very important thing to spend some time on. But I watch a lot of that on TV. That's really, sometimes I'll turn the TV on and that's just what I'll leave it at. I'll, I'll just, you know, kind of have it on even in the background on those channels for the whole day and just check in here and there. Sometimes I'll watch it more intently than others. Uh, but otherwise, local news. I don't watch the national networks because it's just way too biased, one way or the other. It always is. There's always that spin. Local news, at least, is a little more raw. They kind of just tell you what's going on in the, the local vicinity, things that are going to impact you. And then I watch NHK as well. NHK, fantastic network. One of my favorites, uh, easily. In addition to the crime stuff, NHK Japan, a wonderful channel. So, instead of watching movies, that's what I kind of occupy any sort of visual time with. But, uh, oh, again, I'll watch one here and there, but I'm not a, a big movie movie goer. We have Ali from Michigan writing in. Greetings, John. I've been a fan of the YouTube channel and podcast for some time now. And in light of your recent ant themed discussion, decided to chime in. Been fascinated by insects my whole life, and currently in a graduate program that devoted to their study. My particular research often involves sitting in a microscope for hours and having your podcast or YouTube videos playing in the background. It's uh, really helped make what this uh, somewhat tedious work is a lot more entertaining. Given your reputation, I'm very interested to get your thoughts on insects as food. While the thought of willingly eating a cricket or mealworm may sound utterly repulsive to many in what is considered the Western world, the practice of eating insects uh, is very common throughout most of the world. Some insect dishes are even seen as delicacies. Furthermore, insects are highly nutritious and contain more protein per gram than meat coupled with the fact that insects require significantly less space, water, or food to be reared, entomophagy is now being seen as a potential means to combat both food insecurity as well as climate change. Though promoting insects for consumption sounds like a hard sell, things like cricket powder make it easy to forget what you're eating as it looks like any other protein powder or flour. And I'm wondering if you've ever or would consider ever eating food that contains insects, as well as if you think the practice has a chance of taking off in the U.S. Thank you for the great content, and I look forward to listening to future shows. Kind regards, Ali from Michigan. Thanks for checking in. I appreciate it. Insects as food. I don't know if it's something that I would ever really be able to get myself to do. You know? If it were ground up into a powder, I might like try it on the camera for a video, but I just don't know if it's something that would really appeal to me. Now, you know, look, I've eaten insects, look, I've, I've eaten them, we all do, I would say on a daily basis. It's something that you realize the uh, FDA rules for insect parts in food it's always there. There's always little pieces here and there. But it doesn't bother you, because it's all... You know, nothing is totally clean. In various sauces and stuff, there's always little microscopic tiny parts of insects that were collected in the harvest and brought in and ground up, and unknowingly, of course, but that happens. And that's why there's various rules and limits, etc. So, I mean... You could say in that regard, of course, it's nothing intentional, but you unintentionally eat those insect parts every single day. Uh, I would say without exception, really. But willingly, like, going out and eating them, I just don't... If someone wants to do it, I don't care. Again, I'm not going to be sitting there and saying, Oh, don't you dare ever eat those insects. If you want to, if that's, like, if that's a lifestyle choice you want to make, then fine, go for it. 
I just don't think it's one that I would really see myself making, you know, personally. I just don't think so. But it's like, again, if if I had to, I would probably do something with a powder like that. Because it's easier. You know, you always have this mental connotation, whether it's true or isn't, that insects are dirty and that they're gross and that they're creepy and this and that. Not all of them, of course, but, you know, when you just think of them, it's like, that's, I think, how most people see it. Again, for instance, when you think back to all of those ghost ants, that colony, I didn't have any motivation to think, I wonder if there's a way that I could just harvest all of those ghost ants and uh, eat them up, you know? Because, again, there were tens of thousands. I bet I could make them into, like, a little insect patty, like uh, in the one... I don't know if it was by the BBC, but the one documentary on the midge flies, <laughs> like they did there, they made a whole burger patty out of the, the midge flies. Like you, that's, you know, an example of that. In that part of, uh, you know, developing Africa, it's seen as a, as, as a good source of, uh, of food. Not like, don't think that everyone there eats the flies, but certainly when it's, when they're so prevalent during a migration or whatever, and there's just clouds of them everywhere, like locusts, it's just, I think, a way that some of the villagers there, it's a way of making lemonade out of lemons, you know, saying, well, we hate these flies, but at least we can get something semi-nutritious out of it. You can research that for yourself if you want. But I just don't think I would do that with, like, the ghost ants or anything. It's, <laughs> I'm sorry. If someone wants to, though, I don't care. Do I think it's going to take off in the uh, U.S.? There's a chance that maybe in certain... I don't know if you would say subcultures, perhaps, but definitely not mainstream, at least for, for a long time. I, I just don't see any way of it being like a mainstream phenomenon, uh, but maybe something like, you know, in certain, certain groups will have small percentages that will, maybe it'll catch on there, but I, I just don't see it becoming a big thing. Again, I would not be a convert to it. Like I said, maybe one day I'd try some powder or something for fun, just to, you know, for the heck of it. But otherwise, I just don't, I just don't think so. I'm just going to keep doing my thing and just inadvertently consume the insect parts every day as I always do with uh, whatever it is that I eat. Because they always, everyone does. Every last person does. But thank you. Thank you. Like I said, really, no one's being harmed there. You do you. If you want to eat insects all day, I don't care. Just make sure you're able to sustain yourself, you know, do so uh, while, while keeping a good, a good balanced diet, right? This is VORW. Feedback and emails are welcome again to VORWINFO at gmail.com. Next email comes in from Tyler. Thanks for answering my question last week on the 2020 hurricane season. My question this week is inspired by a comment you made on the last show. You mentioned you prefer cats over dogs, and that while you still liked dogs, you remain iffy on pit bulls. I'm wondering if this comes from any personal experience, or is it more to do with the dangerous stigma associated with the breed? Pit bulls are possibly the most misunderstood dog breed, uh, with many of their supposed negative traits coming from irresponsible and inhumane dog ownership. Uh, due to these unfortunate misconceptions, pit bulls are some of the dogs least likely to be adopted in animal shelters and humane societies, and therefore more likely to be euthanized. So I would say that there are no iffy dogs, just iffy people, and that pit bulls are no more dangerous than any other breed of dog, and they can be just as kind, loyal, and goofy from Tyler. Well, thank you, Tyler, for your opinion. Now, I do speak from experience, though. That's why. Now, maybe, again, it could all be tied back to the owner, but the thing also that it would then come down to is, of course, with many other uh, breeds of dogs, you know, it's not like pit bulls are the only ones that have bad owners, right? Unfortunately, you know, they're really, I wish there weren't any bad owners. Uh, dogs and cats, you know, deserve, they, they deserve love. They deserve to be treated kindly and properly and humanely. And unfortunately, you do have just neglectful, uh, cruel owners 
really for every last breed of dog or cat that there is. Pit bulls, of course, being no exception. But the one thing is that, it's sad to talk about, but so many other breeds of dogs do have bad owners, but regardless of that, they may not end up still as aggressive or violent as some pit bulls can be. Now, I know that there are plenty of individuals who own pit bulls who might be listening to the broadcast and be saying, well, my dog hasn't given me or anyone else any problems. That's very true. Um, but I, I do personally, personal opinion, and mind you, I said the word opinion, I'm not saying this is a fact, but just my, my thoughts. So don't think that I'm saying uh, this is proof that they are this way, is just what I think. I do think that they are a more aggressive type of dog, though. Again, speaking from experience, I know someone who was walking uh, their dog, which was just a non-aggressive, uh, you know, your standard cute little puppy. Pitbull comes over and practically kills it for no reason, just to just to kill the poor thing. And uh, totally unprovoked, totally uncalled for, just pure regression. Before that, I, you know, I was never a big fan of pit bulls, but I really, you know, my thoughts on them were just like, eh, I know they're a tough dog and it's just not for me, but after that, and, eh, of course, you can look at all the recorded experience of, of people who have been killed by them, etc. I'm just not a fan. Uh, that's just, that's the one breed of, of dog that, again, I'm not a fan of. Do I... You know, do I think that there's a, maybe a time and place for pit bulls? Yes, but I just don't know how I really feel about, you know, just ownership as pets. Again, maybe someone, you think you could still have a pit bull, but I think you just have to, you have to know what you're doing. That's all. You know, it's just, every dog is different. Every breed of dog is different. You know, I don't think you could train or treat one breed, you know, in one way and one a different way. It's just... Certain have different traits and characteristics, and pit bulls are more aggressive. But it's just not, not for me. Can't say I'm a fan of them. So uh, that's my two cents. We've got Clint checking in. I've been listening to your shows on YouTube and sometimes on uh, WebSDR. Enjoy the content. I suffer from Lyme disease and have battled insomnia for several decades now. Although with treatment, I have a lot of improvements. I find your show extremely relaxing and enjoyable, and I've been listening to it if I wake up in the night, and it helps me relax and sleep. So thank you. I wanted to mention, since I believe you spent time in New York, I see similarities with you that I feel I have due to my Lyme disease. From the insomnia to your comments on cold extremities to even some behaviors I see on video, like the disappointment is a measurable one, I see a bit of myself and my struggle with Lyme disease and related co-infections. I could be wrong, I'm no doctor and I'm not trying to be upsetting. When I first sought out treatment, my doctor had me complete this questionnaire. I found that many of my bizarre symptoms like brain fog were all listed. Here's a couple of links, the Horowitz Lyme questionnaire and the ILADS doctor search. Uh, there could also be a lot of good message board forums that help people uh, learn Lyme disease, learn about it. I felt compelled to share this with you, as I feel it is an incredibly underreported problem, and in my personal life it's been an absolute shipwreck, but treatment has helped. If it has any chance of helping, at least I could do uh, to repay you for all the content you provide us. So thank you, uh, Clint, for your kind email. Interesting that you mentioned Lyme disease. You know, I've never gotten, again, tested or checked or any of that for it. I know that Lyme disease is uh, prevalent, I, I believe, I don't know if I'm correct in this or not, but I believe amongst uh, ticks, right? Ticks in the, the Northeast and the New York, New Jersey area. When I was young, I would go hiking up there, but I would always try to be responsible, although, isn't that what everyone says? How could this happen to me, right? I did everything right. I, you know, you get that a lot with the uh, coronavirus now. You get people who might get sick and they're like, yeah, but I, I did everything right. I tried to wear the masks and stay in. And how did I get it? I don't even know how I got it. But 
you know, sometimes things, they just find a way. Finds a way. We're not perfect. No one is. We all make mistakes. But I would always try to be responsible because I was aware of the dangers of ticks and Lyme disease and all of that. And either way, uh, I know that I would be very covered up whenever I would go in the woods. I would have the long socks, I would have hiking boots, I would wear long pants, um, long sleeve shirts, uh, everything, you know, I would, but for that exact purpose. And then afterwards, do a tick check and all of that, and um, never really, never found any. But I, I imagine there might be other ways of getting it as well. But it's interesting that you mention that. Uh, certainly something I'll read up on more, and I mean, again, you never know. You never know. It could just be that's just how I am. Maybe it is Lyme disease, I don't know. I'll research it more, thanks for bringing it up to my attention. But uh, I'll, certainly, I'll certainly read it a little bit. Thankfully, uh, today, you know, that issue with my tongue continues to get better, continues to heal, which is great. The only thing in its place has just been... Earlier, especially, the uh, tinnitus acting up again, which is no fun. Usually, you know, I, I realized that I've had it for a very long time. But I am fortunate enough to say, you know, tinnitus is a condition where you have that high-pitched noise in your ear. Uh, sometimes it could be low-pitched, or it could be high-pitched, or it could be very loud or quiet. It could even muffle your hearing. It can last for long times. It could last forever. Or it could come in bouts or at different strengths. And it's something that's just annoying. And there's no cure for it, no treatment. It's just like, well, either live with it indefinitely or uh, hope it goes away, and that's about it. But I've had it for a very long time, for really as long as I can remember. And most of the time... Um, that high, it's high pitched for me. It's a high pitched sound. What what causes? I think they they say what causes um, tinnitus is issues with like the hairs in your inner ear or something like that. It's just nothing that they can really do about it. But it's usually there twenty four seven. But it's at the point where it's just I'm used to it. I'm used to the the tone. And it's usually quiet enough that it's just like I can put it in the background and totally live with it, 100%. It's like not any sort of issue to me. I, I imagine there's all different severities, and thankfully for me, it's usually on the very mild side. I can just not even think about it, and it's just not a problem to me. I can go about my business. Now, if I really sit there in a quiet room, then you'll notice it much more. But I just don't pay attention to it, and it's fine. But I tell you this, earlier, oh gosh, it was the worst I'd had it in a long time, because it was so loud that, and this is almost a first for me, it was so loud that it made, it was in my right ear, it was so loud that it made the hearing muffled in it. It, it was like, you know, you would think, I don't know if you would say like everything is, it felt like there was this terrible ear congestion. And the sound of that high pitch was just cranked up so, so loud. My left ear was fine, but the right ear, not so much. Took a look, there was no wax or anything, you know, the eardrum was there, it was just acting up. And, um, I don't know, what worked for me somehow was... It, it was just because I knew the high pitch sound wasn't going to go away. But what really bothered me was I had, you know, my left ear was perfectly fine, could hear just fine, but that contradiction of sounds and whatnot sounding like muffled in one ear versus clear in the other was just really messing me up. It was like I couldn't focus, I couldn't concentrate on anything, cause it's just, I don't know, anything you do just sounds so off, so weird. So I said, well, it would be better if I just can't hear anything at all out of that ear go without one for the day and maybe it'll get better so took an earplug shoved it in and blocked out the sound completely uh, left it in for like three or four hours and then i was feeling daring enough to remove it 
And um, after doing that, it felt better. You know, it's just... At least, I mean, the sound is still there, but it's much, it's much quieter. It's pretty much, it's like a little, nor a little louder than normal, but it's much, um, much, much better. And that like congested, muffled feeling is gone. So, very happy about that. Very happy that that has dissipated. And um, I don't know, everything seems on the up and up. At least that annoying cut in my mouth is is getting much better. That tinnitus which was causing me an issue yesterday is getting better so i'm on i'm on the up and up on an upward twi up upward trend not twend trend i don't know just annoyances really it's nothing that's gonna lead to you know anything anything awful it's just annoying and it just frustrates you and it doesn't i wish i could think clearer when this stuff is going on but sometimes it just breaks your concentration uh, yeah, on the up and up either way. Have an email coming in from Troy. Uh, just a short email about the deleted videos. Uh, YouTube is blocking videos that conjecture about coronavirus. Only the official UN uh, WHO viewpoint is allowed. Uh, basically censorship. Glenn Beck also had his coronavirus video blocked. Um, this is the new normal we live in. Thank you, Troy. Yeah, it's, you know, they make the rules, it's their site, but can't say I agree with them. You know how it is, right? It's like, I understand the rules, I mean, it's, I'm thankful I could still do what I do, but oh, I don't agree with them. That's why there's plenty of subjects that I would bring up on this show if I didn't have to worry about uh, these types of rules. I would definitely have more of like um, conspiracy-oriented discussion. But it's just, this This isn't the time and place for it, sadly. You know, I can... I was reading about Bill Gates the other day. Be happy to talk about him, but... This isn't This isn't the place to do it. I know if I, if I did that, you can kiss this uh, show goodbye. It's... You know, certain things are tolerated more than others. But maybe somewhere else. Maybe one day somewhere else. Give it a shot. We'll see. So, uh, thank you, Troy. Good to hear from you. I know you'll write in every now and then, and uh, always a pleasure to hear from you. Eric in Winter Park, Florida, writes in. Good to hear from you, Eric. You've been a long-time listener, too, and uh, please be safe over there in Winter Park. Cases are uh, really going up, so uh, just stay, stay on your toes. But he writes, Hey, John, uh, like most people, I'm enjoying the uh, longer shows. Takes me a day or two to finish them, but I'm not complaining. Had a few questions. Number one. Now that Steak and Shake has gone downhill, and I absolutely agree with you there, what is your favorite chain restaurant? Has it reverted to Five Guys, as you stated, uh, was your previous favorite, or uh, has another taken the top place? You know, I don't know if it's... I don't know if I really have, like, a total favorite right now. So let me tell you, one place that is rising pretty quickly in the ranks is um, that Freddy's place that I've been I've been trying them out again. I, I went there another time. Again, got another burger from them. They're good. Uh, they seem to be consistently good, and that's definitely a big thumbs up. Not that they're my favorite. I've had I've had better, of course, but Freddy's is good. Um, Culver's Culver's is another good one. They they usually do things good. They take pride in their 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 work. Culver's is good too. So those two, at least for like fast food burger places, um, both have been really good lately. I wish In and Out Burger was uh, in my area. I wish they weren't just West Coast only because, you know, when I had them back in 2016, they were fantastic. So I wish In and Out Burger was more prevalent could give them a try but I don't know maybe maybe there'll be another chance to uh to do something like that <clears throat> um question two I'm not sure when it happened or if you've already addressed it um but why did you stop asking for listeners to audio record their correspondence I always enjoyed hearing people uh, in their own voices especially the more colorful listeners made it feel more like a live call-in show for me well, thanks, Eric. I'm glad you uh, enjoyed that part of the part of the broadcast. I enjoyed it too. 
I liked hearing the uh, listeners' voices, but I, you know, that that part of the show was. It was like 50-50. Some listeners really liked it, others didn't. There might be a day where... Another thing is that... I think I really had that part of the program when each show would be question-based. You know, so I would have a topic, and then I would, um... You know, ask for responses just on that. Uh, It was a way of just being able to get more listener feedback in... And uh, for listeners who preferred preferred to verbalize their thoughts as opposed to um, writing them down. Now, lately here, I've just been keeping the mailbag open. I'll talk about anything. But if I do decide to, like, maybe revert to something, just question slash um, answer based. I don't know, maybe I'll bring it back at least at some point, just just to see, you know, test the water, dip that metaphorical toe in, see what happens, how people feel about it, if any response comes in through that. So, I mean, there's still a, there's still a chance that that segment will come back, but I will say it was fun. It was fun, but it was like an acquired taste. Some listeners liked it more than others. And three, actually, I think I already addressed this one, so I imagine I already answered it. Um... <laughs> it's true though it's true you speak the truth so that I know what other people are going to ask and I know you've already said you'll address it but you mentioned being iffy toward pit bulls <laughs> that's a hot topic and I'm guessing you're going to upset some people over the comment but I'm eager to hear your reasons yeah I mean it's mostly like I had already said it's it's largely personal um I've just you know you see you see what happens and it just changes. It changes your viewpoint. But still, I'm not... You get some people that are so far, it's like, just uh, kill off all the pit bulls, you know? I'm not one of those people. It's just, they're just, they're not a dog for me. That's all I gotta say, really. It's like, yeah, just not a fan. <laughs> not a fan. All right, I had to take a short pause in the recording because my computer needs to update, and it's just one of those things that I can't, I can't prevent, more often than not, I'll put it off until there's a time that's convenient, and then it ends up getting annoyed at me, and then it just says, no, you're not going to be able to cancel it anymore, so. Oh, well, now I'm going to have to just use my phone to, um, look at the rest of the emails, which is something I've gotten a little better at over the years, but I'm still by no means a master, but just work with the tools at, at your disposal, you know, that's what it comes down to, so. Just got set up there, and anyway, sip of water for good luck. Let's uh, switch to platforms here and just use the mobile device. All right, let's figure this out. At least I have all the emails I wanted to get to marked down, so that makes it a bit easier. Here we go. Okay. Next email comes in from Maya. She says, Dear VORW, Thank you kindly for responding again to my feedback uh, in the last show. In your case, I think when people not being able to uh, agree to disagree, they had put you on a pedestal, so when you say something that does not match their perfect image of you, you fall from a very high point. It's impossible to live up to strangers' imaginations and expectations, and nothing to strive for either. So, you doing the right thing, not trying to please everyone. In regular life, when people can't agree to disagree, they just drop someone for it. And I think the sad reason is that they were never attached to that person anyway, so leaving is easy. In other words, they can use disagreement as an excuse to leave. Sorry for not having a light topic to suggest on your future shows, but that's simply not my field. I'm more into behavior, psychology, medicine, crime, etc., Uh, that I do understand is not for all. But I do want to say, as a last thing, hats off to you for a great uh, entertainment in both the videos and the radio. You do a really great job from Maya. Well, thank you, Maya, for your kind words. And uh, that's that's a good point that you raise, and I think it's very true. In that, yeah, I think most, most rational people can agree to disagree on a good number of things. And it's like, yeah, no one thinks exactly alike. We all have our differences, but that doesn't mean 
just because we don't see eye to eye on one thing, now we're mortal enemies, you know, it's... But, yeah, I think, like, especially in terms of online stuff like that, over just one thing, I sometimes do think people are looking for a reason to uh, just be nasty, you know? They're looking for a reason to uh, to go after you and and just be mean, you know? Like you said, I think... I think some people, maybe they just, they never really wanted to be here to begin with, and finally, in their mind, they have a valid reason to finally depart. You know, sometimes I, I just wish people didn't need to search for a reason like that. If they just don't like it, then just go. I'm not going to be hurt by it. It doesn't bother me. <laughs> but, who knows, the psychology of things is always, is always interesting and confounding at times, to tell you the truth. All right, let's see what else we've got. Have an email coming in from Grace in England. Uh, just a miscellaneous uh, topic, as I recently found, uh, or miscellaneous point, I should say. I recently found your podcast and channel, and it's really cool. I like your channel because you don't have wild editing, and your style is epic. I listen to your podcast on Spotify, and I'm trying to work out how to use my radio, so bear with me. I'm sure, uh, I'm pretty sure this is your email, but if it isn't, then that's awkward. Uh, thank you, Grace. It is, it is the email, you're in the right place, so no, uh, no awkwardness whatsoever. But, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll respond certainly in writing and, uh, just give you the best frequencies for, uh, England. The, uh, the one broadcast to Europe continues to, uh, do very nicely. Recently got some, uh, listener, uh, reports coming in from Poland and Sweden as well. So uh, the signal is able to get over there and uh, reach that part of uh, of Europe as well, which was nice. It's always, it's always interesting to see where, uh, where listeners pick it up from. But thank you. I'm glad, I'm glad you also like the uh, style of, of videos. I'm glad some people say, oh, you need to edit it more. But you also get a lot of people that say, no, I like the way that it is. So thank you. Uh, I, I, I don't like the over-the-top editing either. I think it's, I don't know, it's just too much. It's like, I guess it has a time and place, but I've never been a fan of it. It's just like, I feel like I'm being bombarded with all this stuff. Like, it's just too, I don't know, fast-paced is the right word, but it's it's just, it's overwhelming. I don't know how else to say it. Again, I bet some people, they like that, but it's just always been, it's almost been like to the point of annoying. It's like... Ugh, I don't even have a, a chance to think. It's just too much. I don't know how else to describe it. Just too much. Overdone, I guess. We have a uh, Malaysian listener checking in. Says, what are your thoughts on hedonism? For example, will you choose A, to be with a girlfriend that cheats on you, but you will never know about it, uh, find out about it, and she's the most perfect in your mind, or B, to know the truth and perhaps never meet a girlfriend that is compatible to that extent. I forgot which YouTube video I watched, but there was a YouTuber uh, which I watched frequently that asked his viewers this question. I found it very interesting, wanted to know your thoughts on it. Uh, would a person choose pleasure or truth? Is seeking pleasure the only point in life? So, uh, thank you. Always good to hear from our listeners over in Malaysia. No, I, I don't think that. I, I don't, I don't really subscribe to the, the, you know, the hedonistic, um, viewpoint. I remember in, I don't know what year it was, maybe it was 2016, I think I said cautious, or something like that, cautious hedonism or something. But even then, it's, it's like, the, the with, with time, I think we all change. Um, you know, our viewpoints change, uh, the way we are changes, and it's it's just like, to me, all right, let's answer your philosophical question, for instance. To be with someone who would cheat on you, you don't know that, but in your mind, everything's good, or to know the truth and not necessarily be with this person that otherwise you might be happy with. But see, the thing is, now you might say, well, what if it was a, uh, you know, a, a 
polygamous um, relationship or something. You know, not really polygamy, but, you know, multiple partners or whatever you want to call it. But that's, that's just adding stuff to this hypothetical. You just have to follow the established rules, because if that was the case, then there would be open communication, and if there wasn't open communication, then there would be issues otherwise. And then it's really not perfect, is it? So, I would choose B, uh, without a single doubt in my mind, completely and totally. Uh, regardless of that, I would rather know the truth and let that be that. Because again, I think in a proper relationship, there needs to be honesty and commitment. And again, if you want to round it back to saying, well, now yeah, maybe she wants to be with someone else. Well, that's fine. But then there needs to be that communication. It can't just be kept silent or secret. Then there needs to be that degree of communication. And if there isn't, then there's an issue. It's not a perfect relationship. And otherwise, the fact that such a thing would be happening, there are issues then, underlying issues or not. So, no, I would, I would prefer it just to know what's going on and let that be that. Uh, so let's answer your, your question. Now, secondly, in a follow-up to that, you asked, in regards to hedonism, would a person choose pleasure or truth? Is seeking pleasure the only point in life? Now, again, years ago, back in 2016, I think I valued, uh, or at least looked at hedonism in a little higher regard than I do now. Um, back then, I was kind of thinking, well, more along the lines of, uh, you know, I want to experience life, I want to experience the world, and at least seek uh, a certain enjoyment from it. Not to say that those inherent ideas have, have changed all that much, but I just, I guess, have more of a uh, emphasis at this point on uh, morals as opposed to just seeking pleasure. That's just one change in me personally, not necessarily one that I will try to press upon someone else, but that's just a change personally inside of me that's just happened um, over the last few years. So I would even, you know, like in 2016, I might have said cautious hedonism. Uh, I would just, I, I wouldn't even go as far as to use that word either anymore. It's like, still enjoy life, enjoy the little things, but for God's sake, be responsible and you have to you have to take accountability for your actions you have to understand that actions have consequences that they impact others as well uh, you know you just have to put thought into all those things you know in the end i think like i've already said i i do believe in freedom and i believe that you should do what you want as long as it's not hurting or, or harming others but i think people know they still need to be responsible they still need to look at their actions and think, well, what's what's the payoff, good or bad? You know, should I really do this? I mean, people just need to look at it that way. And um, that's, just, that's just my viewpoint on it. So, you know, pleasure over truth, and truth every single time is what I will choose. I don't care. But likewise, I think that there's a time and place for both of those things. You know, I think in life you could have the good times and the good moments, but you shouldn't blissfully, you know, just stick your head in uh, in the clouds and uh, only focus on that and ignore whatever what else is going on. Um, but at the same time, I don't think one should just become totally despondent either, focused on this one thing and not enjoy a single thing in life. Uh, though I know, <laughs> given certain circumstances, look, that's easier said than done. For people who are depressed, you know, look at it this way. How easy is it if some someone who doesn't understand what you're going through goes ahead and tells you while you're going through a really tough time, you know, mentally, and just says, just be happy. It's like, and gee, you, you, you think if it was that easy, would I really feel the way that I do anymore? You know, you know that that's easier said than done. But... I think it's all about balance. It's all about just trying to balance things out at this point in time. So uh, that's my viewpoint there. But truth definitely, at, at, at this point, 
has a much um much higher preference for me than it would have a couple years ago, probably in, in terms of answering that question. Thank you for sending it in. All right, the next email comes in from Ralph. He writes, been listening to the shows since 2018, so I'm a relatively new fan. Your shows give me a tremendous amount of peace, and I look forward to listening to your programs while completing household errands. Uh, I hope you don't take that as a criticism of your work, that I enjoy cleaning while listening to your programs. It's me, I'm the weird one. Now, to interject, uh, don't don't worry about that one single bit. Do whatever you want while you listen. I, I really don't care. And that's why, look, if it allows for more productive cleaning, then by all means, you know, uh, just listen. It. Like, that's why when someone said to me once, you know, some people will say uh, that they listened uh, while they go to sleep. Uh, don't you find that offensive to your show that people fall asleep to it? I said, no, not at all. That doesn't bother me one single bit. Because especially for me, do you know what an absolute pain and chore it is to fall asleep every single night? To even try to get to that point? If this broadcast is able to help any number of individuals be able to achieve that state of relaxation, then by all means, just keep doing whatever it is that you're doing. And if listening to this show does that, then by all means, use it as a sleep aid. I don't care if you even listen to one single word of it, but if it's something that helps you get to sleep, stay asleep, just keep it up because sleep, I know what a frustrating thing it is to try to achieve. I myself, I like sleep. I like it a lot. It's just trying to fall asleep is such a process for me every single night. can't even fall asleep on my own anymore. I wish I could, but I can't. You know, I always have to take one thing or another because it's just, you know, it's past that point. It's just impossible now. It's just gotten too bad. So what can you do? You know, at least such things exist. I wish it were easy enough for me to be able to listen to something and be able to fall asleep that way, but it's it's sadly not. Because the problem for me is that my ears lock on to whatever the sound is, and I just start listening. And instead of trying to fall asleep, I'm paying attention to whatever it is the person is talking about. You know, white noise works best, but like listening to talk or music, then I just, I just start listening to the song. I'm like, yeah, let's hear, let's hear more of this or whatever. Start paying attention to the instruments, and that's not calming my mind down or trying to relax it. Instead, it's actually getting more active. So I can't, I can't do that. There was a time again. I used to, like ten years ago, be able to fall asleep um, with the television on, but even then, uh, you know, every now off, uh, every now and then. I would have an issue where it would usually be late at night and it would be some boring infomercial that was on. But sure enough, my ear, I would just start listening and I would I would be hearing this person trying to sell some sort of um, oven or something. And then before I know it, instead of laying down trying to sleep, I'd be laying down there with my eyes closed listening to the commercial. <laughs> It was like, uh, what's the point? What's the point? I'm not going to fall asleep like this. <laughs> you know. But that's that's the thing. The one thing I realized is that I always... I always keep my ears... Perked. I try to, anyway. They're not perfect, but... I certainly try to uh, establish... At least various... I don't know. I always try to sense any sort of abnormalities with them. It's like if I'm ever going for a walk, you know, especially at night, and I hear, let's say, a car coming up the road, I always just lock on to it immediately, and I always listen very, very closely to determine if it's slowing down, um, how far away it is, if it seems to be accelerating, what it's doing, just in order to be able to gauge its behaviors without even turning around and making anyone think if they're a bad person or whatever, that they've been seen or whatever, you know, you don't want to stand out. 
So it's just able to use that and just hone in on your other senses to make it like a second pair of eyes. Same thing with other noises, etc. I always try to pinpoint them down very quickly uh, in order to just make sure it's um, nothing of concern. Now, vision, on the other hand, at some point I'll need a pair of glasses. I'm not there yet. You know, I can still see pretty good. I think the last eyesight test I did, I was still 20-20, but I know at some point I'll have to get glasses because it's just... I think it would just be a pair of, like, reading glasses or something. It's just, you know, I can see just naturally the things distant away. But then when I look at something closer, like, let's say, a book or whatever, it used to be it would just effortlessly focus onto the words closer. But now it's like I have to manually do that. Like, otherwise, when I look down at the page, it's kind of blurry or it's kind of like just out of focus completely. And then I have to just make that manual change. It's like you're flipping a little switch. Instead of it just, you know, being natural, it's now something that I just have to do, you know, on um, on my own. It's like, all right, time to focus in. <laughs> There's no pain or any sort of discomfort there, but it's just like, I don't know. It's just one of those things. I'll, I'll get it checked out one day, but it's not too high on my um, priorities list right now. Well, anyway, I got on a long tangent there. Uh, let's get back to your email. It said, initially I was a fan of your VORW shows that included music, and my favorite song you played once was uh, Dave Von Ronk's He Was a Friend of Mine. Never heard that song, and uh, it was a beautiful song to discover one summer afternoon. I've been hesitant to send you an email, since I imagine you get an overwhelming amount of correspondence from fans, and as such, I thought my words may not reach you, or they might fail to interest you. But after thinking things through, I reconciled those two doubts by thinking two things. If my words never reach you, then just as well. But if they happen to reach you and they bore you, it was with good intentions to express my gratitude for the work you produce. So it is in these regards I'm writing to you. As an aside, I tried to think of an interesting topic for you to speak on if it piques your interest for one of the future shows. If by luck you discovered an ant attempting to speak to you with a miniature megaphone, what would your response be? You said once, to ask a question and not give your own thoughts is rude, I believe the same. I for one would be flabbergasted and would initially be uneasy because immediately I would wonder how an ant could speak and how did it get a megaphone? Maybe it would be my first question to the ant. Uh, how was this megaphone produced and why would you have it? If you've gotten this far, Thanks again for the peace you've given me these last two years. Truly, it's been well received. So thank you, Ralph, for your kind words. Uh, good to have you as a listener as well. Uh, two years. Great to have you on board. And uh, always a pleasure to hear from our listeners. Long time or first time. So, you know, let's say I'm out and I see a ghost ant. All right, let's go. We'll keep it with those vile creatures. Yeah, let's not call them vile creatures. I just did. Let's hope, let's hope none with keen ears are listening right now. <laughs> um, but let's say I'm outside and I happen to see a ghost ant scurrying about and it has this little, um, little, you know, ant-sized megaphone and it's trying to communicate with me. First and foremost, I wouldn't believe my eyes. I would think that I'm hallucinating. I would think like, how can this be real, right? It's we're, we're, we're taught to believe that they have their own means of communication, but they're never going to break that barrier. So number one, my entire understanding of how things work would suddenly be, it, it, would, it would be blown away. Then I would also begin to wonder, is this ant even a real ant? I mean, what if it's something else that's you know, disguised as an ant? Who knows? What if it's like some sort of intelligent form of uh, extraterrestrial life and for some weird reason decided to cloak itself as an ant? But in the end, number one, I would try to document it very, very um, clearly. And I would listen to it to try to see what it has to say. I would at least try to make that effort. 
uh, and I would I would try to talk to it. I would try to communicate back, but at the same time I would be cautious as well, because well, what what would the ant's intention be? Like, how do I know? You know, it could talk the talk, say it's friendly and everything, but how do I know it's not just trying to get retribution for all its fall, uh, fallen comrades? It's really plotting against me, right? I don't know that. Might be on very bad terms, and it's just trying to say, you know, do this just to kind of get my guard down and all that. Um, but secondly, I would try to keep track of it, and I would definitely contact uh, a reputable, you know, maybe uh, at least some sort of research facility, any anything I could find. And that might be hard with the with the COVID and everything going on here, especially. They might be like, "Yo, oh, get out of here!" You know, what are you, are you prank calling me as yes. ant with a megaphone and stuff? And then I could take a video of it. They'd say, oh, you photoshopped that in, you um, did that through uh, CGI, whatever. And then I'd be like, no, I'm here with this incredible discovery and not a single person believes it. You know, it's, it's, that's the thing. But I would certainly try my best, but I would try to communicate back to it. The only thing I think I would have to remember is that I don't think I would need to talk all that loud for, you know, the little ant to to um, be able to, to comprehend me. So I try to be gentle. You can't forget that. The differences in force. But it would certainly be a, uh, a unique day, and all I would hope is that, you know, it, uh, I, I, would just, I would just be interested in seeing what it has to say. But yeah, I would be, I'd be absolutely, be, I'd be blown away by that. That reminds me when I was just thinking of, I was just thinking to myself, you know, like cryptids and all that interest me greatly, of course. And um, one of my favorite cryptids has always been uh, Bigfoot and Sasquatch and all of the derivatives. And I was just thinking to myself, you know, it's like if someone ever actually, let's just say that this this creature was actually real, but maybe in small population numbers in uh, extremely remote areas. Let's say someone actually managed to get a definitive sample of proven DNA that, if tested, would, you know, legitimize the existence of this or whatever. But it's it's like, you could say you have this, but how many places are actually going to believe you? How many places, especially, again, with everything that's going on, are even going to waste the time and effort to test this, you know? Not all that many. I mean, if you really, really search, perhaps, but you also might not have a lot of money yourself. You might not even be able to assemble the resources to go to these whatever places might be interested. It's like you have this fantastic discovery waiting, but just (laughs) the cards aren't in your favor at this this given time. But that reminds me, um, there's a new book out on the matter uh, by Max Brooks. I got I got it. It's brand new. It's it's hot off the presses. Max Brooks is uh, an author who who I like. He wrote the um, book World War Z, which that terrible movie back in twenty was it twenty thirteen was made based off of. Though really the, the the movie World War Z, the only thing it has in common with the book is the title, and and that's pretty much it. If they didn't call that movie World War Z, I think I would have held it in a lot higher regard, and it's just tough, because the the problem is that I had such high expectations, and it's when it's totally different, you're let down. What else can you say? You're let down. And also, the zombies in, in the World War Z movie behave nothing like the ones in the book. But World War Z, the, the book, I imagine a number of you listening have read it, uh, it's, it's a good book. I enjoy it, especially if you enjoy zombies and stuff. It'll be it'll be a fun read. Where it's just, I think it takes place, you know, in in the future after this absolutely devastating, um, you know, worldwide zombie apocalypse that nearly brings down civilization, but humanity is able to to overcome it and bounce back. 
but it's by this guy who I think works from the UN and is just interviewing various figures um, with their experiences during it. It's just so fascinating because it's just like so many different stories and, you know, Max Brooks is just a, a great, great writer. You know, you hear these experiences of, of people, you know, during the, um, you know, the zombie apocalypse and anyone from <laughs> this one guy who is this bodyguard for celebrities and um, someone who, you know, was uh, even on the space station, someone who was in a nuclear submarine and someone who um, was in the military on the front lines. It was just so well written. It was just, it was a very, very fantastic book. It takes place all over the world, too, and it's just a good book. I really enjoyed it. So when I found out that Max Brooks was releasing a new book, this one being about Bigfoot, I thought to myself, oh my gosh, you better believe I'm going to be all over this thing. And, yeah, I got it. It came out this month. It's called uh, Devolution. And I'll just say, I've been uh, reading it this last week, uh, it's been a quick read, not because it's a short book. Um, you know, it's not the longest in the world, but, you know, it's a good 300 pages or so. But again, I've been I've been making very good progress each, uh, each day because it's an enjoyable book. And that's the thing. You ever read a good book and it's like, wow, you know, I'm re- you're really enjoying its contents and you don't realize how many pages you've gone through in the time you've sat down to read it. It's like, wow, this is great. You know, whereas the books that are eh, not the best, it's just like you're sitting there and it's like, oh, gosh, I can't even make it through this, you know, this chapter and it's only 10 pages. It's like, I can't even do this. It just comes down to a book you enjoy versus one you don't. Um, but this book has been a very fast read in that regard. And... um Again, I don't want to give anything away too much. But I think just the most basic premise would be would be completely acceptable. So it's written in the form of several pieces of media that are gathered. And the largest part of it... Because the whole premise is that this is media that's collected by this journalist who decides to pub- publish this story because it's just gotten so little attention otherwise. And it's based on the findings of this one person's journal, you know, so it's like a series of journal entries. Also an interview with um, the brother of the person whose uh, journal was discovered. And uh, I think this one uh, head uh, park ranger, you know, and so that's in the interview form, similar to kind of World War Z, though not quite, and then journal entries as well. But it takes place in uh, Washington State, near Mount Rainier, and I would say it doesn't take place. I don't know if it's in the present, but in the immediate future, I would say. I don't know, maybe, you know, between now and 2025 at latest. So, you know, really you could you could say it's in the present pretty much or within the next couple of years, but nothing nothing crazy otherwise. And the setting is it, it takes place in this new community that's really out in the middle of nowhere. And it's supposed to be this place that is largely for individuals who have the money to go here, number one, you know, for, I don't know if you want to call it the elites, but definitely people who are well off, where it's supposed to be like rural living for people who don't want to leave the city. So it's like this fancy, you know, community of of some houses out there in the middle of, again, absolutely nowhere in the mountains here. But, you know, it's not really off the grid. They have their private road. They have fiber optic cables connected, you know, to the cities. So they have everything, you know, they have very, very fast internet. These are these fancy, like, smart houses. Everything is uh, connected through 
the internet and AI and uh, automation, etc. They can order their groceries and get them delivered through drones and stuff. So they could work from these these houses as well. So it's like for people, I would I would say it's largely like the you know well off um, big tech types who want to be out in the woods and out in the middle of nowhere, but don't want to really leave all the comforts uh, from urban life behind. Which, you know, that's an interesting premise. And it seems like, you know, a nice, a nice place. I honestly wouldn't be a fan of that with all that, all that utter reliance on the internet, to tell you the truth, but in the book anyway, you know, it's, it, it appeals to a certain type. It's not a huge community, maybe like 10 people live there or so. But everything's going good until in the book and uh, in its, you know, kind of fictional universe, Mount Rainier explodes. And after that, let's just say that just maybe the uh, fragility of that infrastructure is exposed. And let's also say that maybe certain uh, local wildlife populations may get displaced by that explosion. And all we'll say is that some interesting things happen afterwards. It's a good book, though. Uh, again, I've made most of my way through it, and uh, I'm glad I've got. I'm glad I got it. It's a, it's a good read, and I would recommend um, you check it out as well if it's if it sounds appealing to you. It's uh, again called um, Devolution, D-E-V-O-L-U-T-I-O-N, by Max Brooks. I've seen some reviews from some critic at uh, this one newspaper who wasn't a fan of it, but the online reviews speak for themselves. Lots and lots of, of, of actual consumers have gotten it, have really enjoyed it, and I would I would put myself with that group as well. And don't feel like I gave anything away, because that's just the basic scene. I'm not going to get into any of the other events that actually happen, or any of the characters, or any of that, so it's a fun read, and um, I think, I, I again, I enjoyed it. It's such a unique setting, too. I think the one big moral of the story, which, again, it doesn't even give anything away from the book. This is more like just a common sense, even real-life type of thing. If you're going to live... In such a remote environment, you better know what you're doing. That's all that I. That's all that you could say. It's like if I decided to live off the grid. Number one, I don't think I even have the capacity to do so. But I would sure as heck know what I want to do. I would make sure that I know engineering. That I have the physical strength to be able to do all these things that I have a knowledge of uh, the geography, all the local uh, flora and fauna, and that I would be well-equipped, that I would know how to properly hunt, how to survive out there, that I would have all these, these tools necessary. So then even in, uh, let's say you're not even totally off the grid, though, at least you'll be prepared and in a grid down situation or something causes you to displace uh, you could easily just pack your stuff and survive you know be like a survivalist really that's why i'm not against the whole prepper uh, survivalist movement again it certainly has its it has its need it has its purpose by by all means it does it's just you know you have to adapt to the environment you find yourself in, not make the environment adapt to you. <laughs> you know how that is? It's like, you cannot make the wilderness conform to what you want or what you don't. If you're going to be out there, you have to find ways to make that work. All right, I think I'm going to get to three more emails, and that's going to be the show. We're going to call it a night after this. So let's take a look and see what we have. All right, I think we're going to end it with three Steak and Shake stories, because you guys remember in the last show, I talked about the the Steak and Shake. <laughs> I saw this one video, I'll never forget it, to tell you the truth. It's from someone in Orlando, believe it or not, so I guess the Florida Steak and Shakes have gotten really bad, 
and you know it's this one guy in the uh, the inner city and he was there and he was just telling it like it is he was saying i think the video is something like um my experience at uh steak and shake uh, or as i call it s and shake <laughs> and he was just oh he was but to tell you the truth i mean he he showed what his burger looked like and yeah it was really if I were him, I would be mad too, to tell you the truth. It's just funny, you know, some people are so, it's just so fired up, you know. But I get it. I get why he was upset, to tell you the truth. Um, but anyway, I've got three Steak and Shake stories that I want to read. This is just because uh, last show I, I shared my bad experience and I said, you know, if you want to share yours, go for it. So here's what we got. Uh, this comes from Zach in Florida. It says... Just heard your story about your bad experience at Steak and Shake, and I can confirm the chain is in decline. I used to work there for several years as a cook and server, and when I first started working, it was great, but I had to quit in 2019, and I believe the management is the root of the problem. At the store I worked at when I was hired, the management worked beside the employees, walked around the dining room, talked to seated customers, and it was a great atmosphere. Fast forward a few years, and a new management comes in, and all they do are complain to the workers that they should do more, while for the most part they sat in the back office playing phone games. Since I had worked for a few years and knew how to do everything in the store, I applied for a management promotion, uh, where I put a lot of work in passing tests and interviews. Finally, after weeks, I got the promotion and found out they had lied to me about the raise and it was only a 25 cent raise from my hourly pay and that was only when I would train new employees. I was furious about this but still kept working trying to be positive. Finally after a week of working where they had over scheduled staff and told me to go home only an hour into my shift because I had too many workers along with their condescending tone to me and others I quit and I could assure you the quality of the food and speed of service were much higher at the store I worked at when they didn't screw over the employees and just treated everyone with more respect. So that's from Zach in Florida. I, I believe you. I mean, it sounds to me like one of these incidents where it is from just the top down. It just gets worse and worse and worse until it just is out of control. So uh, thank you, uh, Zach, oh, again over there in Florida. We have Drew, uh, I think also in Florida, says a uh, response to Steak and Shake. As someone who was born and raised um, in the South Florida area that has several Steak and Shakes, I'm well acquainted with the chain. One of my earliest memories of eating out as a kid was going here on my birthday with my family. I'd get a tasty burger and fries and finish it off with a birthday shake that was brought out with fanfare. And of course, I get that little paper Steak and Shake hat to wear. Steak and Shake used to be one of the favorite uh, fast food restaurants, uh, just as it used to be for you, which is why it saddens me to say that I completely agree with your opinion on the current state of this chain. I pinpointed the decline starting sometime around 2018, maybe late 2017 at the earliest. Steak and Shake quickly went from being very accurate with orders to one of the most inaccurate in a short amount of time. I have no clue what prompted the steep decline, to make matters worse, the quality of the food was taking a nosedive at the exact same time. And the part that sealed the deal was the fact that the prices were increased, despite the product and service being undeniably worse than before. If the prices were increased, but the quality, accuracy, and service stayed roughly the same, I don't think the chain would be facing as many troubles. Many fans of the restaurant have gone less and less, myself included, because we were fed up with incorrect orders, low quality burgers, cold, stale tasting fries, poor customer service, slow drive through times, and on top of that, they want you to pay more for it. Looking up the history of the chain, it seems that the sale to Big Larry ultimately led to its downfall. I still hold on to hope that Steak and Shake will one day rise again to its previous height, but it seems more and more unlikely. These issues were happening way before the COVID-19 crisis, which might be the final nail in the coffin for the chain. Either that, or it will be a wake-up call needed to refocus the brand on what made it successful in the first place. 
And uh, he also recommends uh, trying out Shake Shack if I get the chance. So thank you, Drew, over there in Florida. Yeah, it's, uh, I, I again, I wouldn't be surprised at all if the sale to new management or new ownership, they just didn't know what they were doing or got greedy and just ran the poor chain into the ground. I wouldn't be surprised if that, that's what happened at all. So thank you for checking in. And I think we got one more um, Steak and Shake story that we can get to. All right, and final email from the show comes in from JD. He says, uh, I'll have to agree with your view on Steak and Shake that it has declined in quality over the span of the last few years. I started eating there when I was a kid and got to experience the restaurant at its peak, which to me was around 2008 to 2014. The milkshakes were perfect and the burgers were delicious with a quality selection of other items like the taco salad and chili five way. Gradually after that golden age, things began to slide. I started to notice things like the floor being dirtier than it should and the bathrooms being frankly kind of gross. Service became my biggest issue and the last time I went, which may very well be the last time I ever go, I sat down and waited at least 20 minutes without even being greeted by a server. Frustrated and hungry at this point, I finally flagged one down and told them my server never showed up. They told me they didn't know where my server went, and as a former server, this is something you should never relay to a guest. When my food did arrive, it was sloppily prepared and presented and didn't taste nearly as good as in the past. I doubt I'll be returning, and if I do, I'll definitely be using the drive through and not dining in. Steak and Shake used to have wonderful food in a unique atmosphere, but sadly now has just become another mediocre at best burger joint. I love the show, especially the random talk, the most relaxing and entertaining. Keep up the good work from JD. Well, thanks JD, good to hear from you. And uh, again, it just sounds like another issue. I mean, I'm glad you mentioned also the dirty floors and tables because I've seen reviews for Steak and Shake increasingly reporting that issue, saying that, yeah, you know, I'm noticing the floors are getting dirty and the tables are sticky and it's not being cleaned. And so, I mean, that's another sign that it's all just going downhill. Hey, let's hope that one day Steak and Shake will turn itself around. I don't have high hopes for them, but maybe there will be a day where they will. Who knows? And with that, remember, any last-minute feedback can be sent in to vorwinfo at gmail.com. Hope to hear from you. Fan art is welcome at that address as well. Questions, comments, topic suggestions, any random stories or uh, factoids or anything you want to share are welcome there. Donations via PayPal to keep this broadcast going. If you enjoyed the show, you want to hear another one, a donation is much welcome and appreciated to V-O-R-W-I-N-F-O at gmail.com. Every little bit helps. You know, there's no monetization on YouTube, no monetization on any podcast platform. I make zero dollars from doing this show, aside from any donations that come in. There's no sort of brand deal or sponsorship, none of that. It's just pretty much me, and that's that's it when I do this show. So please consider helping this out. Again, a donation via PayPal is welcome to vorwinfo at gmail.com or via Patreon at patreon.com slash the report of the week. Thank you for listening. Do take care. Please be safe. Be healthy. Treat each other with kindness, respect, and dignity. Be a good person. Take care. This is VORW.